Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. So I'm Vicki Whittemore, a program director at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where I oversee grants on MECFS and work together with my colleague Joe Breen and Dr. Koroshetz to coordinate the Trans NIH MECFS Working Group. So it's um, our pleasure to present today the fifth webinar in the series. Um, we've been working with a really excellent group of investigators, clinicians, and individuals with lived experience, as well as members of patient um, and leaders of patient advocacy groups as part of the NINDS Advisory Council, MECFS Research Roadmap Working Group. So you can see the list of all the individuals here who are on the working group. Um, the co-chairs are Lucinda Bateman from Bateman Horn Center and the co other co-chair is Maureen Hansen from Cornell University. So I'd like to thank and acknowledge the working group that planned this particular webinar. The chair was more, is Maureen Hansen, um, and in, these individuals have all served to work um, with Maureen to organize this webinar. I'd also like to thank my team at NINDS, who has been have been really fantastic in helping to really coordinate things behind the scene, and also acknowledge our partners at RLA for all of their logistical and help and and coordination for all of the for all of the webinars as part of this webinar series. So there, this is as I said, this is a fifth in a series of eight. So after this webinar today, we have three more, one December 8th on physiology, January 5th on lesser study pathologies, and one January 11th on circulation. If for more information about any of these research roadmap initiatives, you can go to the website. If you go to NINDS website and just type in MECFS research roadmap, you'll get that will take you to information about this working group and, and all of this, the webinars. Video recordings and transcripts from past webinars are posted on the Research Roadmap website, which is there. You can get to it through this website, or also you can get to it again through the NINDS website. Oops, sorry. Um, so just some guidance for participation in the, in the webinar today. The goal of the webinar is really to identify research priorities for research on the role of chronic infection in MECFS. What do we know? What don't we know? And what do we need to know to accelerate research? And how will this information help us to inform and identify new targets for treatment of MECFS? So questions for each speaker will be addressed immediately after their presentations. So put your questions in the Q&A. We are unable to answer questions that pertain directly to your individual health situation. So please refrain from putting those types of questions in the chat or in the Q&A. We're really looking here to talk about research priorities moving forward. Um, at the end of this whole process, after all eight of the webinars, we'll be putting together a report that will go to the NINDS Advisory Council and NINDS leadership and will be presented at their May 2024 meeting. For additional feedback, you can send an email to this email address, MECFS Research Roadmap at nindsnih.gov. And the best way to stay informed about things from the activities that are happening at NIH are to sign up for the listserv at this URL. Um, and we will be soliciting information and feedback from the community on the research priorities using a tool called Idea Scale, and we'll be sending out information. We're in the process of getting that set up for the first four webinars. So as soon as that's ready to go, we'll be sending information out about how to access that platform and how to provide feedback on the research priorities. So with that, I will would like to introduce Maureen Hansen, one of the co-chairs of the whole MECFS Research Roadmap Initiative, as well as the chair of this planning group. Um, I'll turn it over to her to introduce the first speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to introduce David Holcomb, who is going to give our 
lived experience uh, session. So uh, David is a caregiver to his wife and two sons that have severe MECFS. He recently retired as a software architect to be able to devote more time to researching potential treatments for his family while also raising awareness of the disease through MECFS San Diego, the 501c3 organization that he co-founded with his wife, Debbie. So uh, David, go ahead and uh, tell us your experience. Thank you, Maureen. So I'm going to start out with a uh, short history of the, the, the family's health history and then go on to discuss some of the challenges and learnings that we've had along the way. Um, so my wife's childhood history, uh, she had some recurring infections as a child, but by the time she was in high school and college, she was a relatively healthy individual um, until 1984 when she got a bad case of mono and ended up having to take a semester off of college. Um, after she returned in her senior year, she was experiencing symptoms from type 1 diabetes that wasn't detected or diagnosed until uh, she failed her first drug screen uh, for her job, first job out of college. Um, then about three years later, she ended up getting endometriosis. And I'm, I'm a little curious if uh, either the type 1 diabetes or the endometriosis or both were triggered by a, a virus, perhaps the, the Epstein-Barr virus that caused the mono. But then later, she was healthy um, until 1992, when she got a bad flu-like illness uh, during her second year of going back to graduate school at UCSD. And um, she never recovered from that. And it was, it was disabled. It turned out to be disabling MECFS. Um, during the illness, uh, the only thing that showed up on, on tests were high um, liver enzyme levels. And I'm wondering if that was perhaps reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus causing that. Um, but we then, you know, went to specialists. Um, she was, de she did get detected that she had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, but her thyroid levels were normal. Um, she was diagnosed with it, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. She had all the rest of the standard um, chronic fatigue, um, so, you know, symptoms. Uh, and I came across a book from Katrina Burns called Running on Empty. And that was, you know, I was like, hey, dear, this sounds exactly like what you're going through. Because, um, you know, we were actually, when she got ill, two months later, we were getting married. and um, she was an avid hiker prior to this and we were going to be doing some hiking in the black hills and she just couldn't go and that was the first real indicator that for me that wow something's wrong here um so we found a specialist in southern california dr jay goldstein and went to him and he was able to confirm the diagnosis of fibromyalgia and MECFS. so we searched for treatments and cures for three years um without any success and we realized that, you know, we had planned on having a family and that, you know, time was ticking. So we talked to a number of specialists and they assured us that, you know, there shouldn't be genetic uh, nature to this. So we went ahead and started having kids. We had our first in, son in 96, our second in 98. Uh, a couple of miscarriages that turned out it was probably likely due to low progesterone because when that was supplemented, we had a successful uh, pregnancy in 2005 with our third son. Um, actually, in our, with the birth of her second son, the um, she had uh, with the epidural uh, a CSF leak um, back in '98, um, and interestingly enough, she had a spontaneous CSF leak in 2009. Um, took her a number of months to realize that it was orthostatic in nature, uh, and then finally was able to tell the doctors, "Hey, I think I have a, I think I have a leak." <laughs> so she self-diagnosed that. Um, then uh, the, our kids were healthy um, until around 2013 when something went through the house. We don't know what it was. We didn't notice it at the time, but our oldest two started having, you know, missing days of school, having uh, stomach problems or head problems, that sort of thing. But we didn't, it wasn't, it was mild enough that we didn't, you know, even the fact we knew about chronic fatigue syndrome, we didn't necessarily, you know, identify it at that time. Another thing that happened shortly after was that my youngest uh, was tested uh, for type 1 diabetes and had two autoimmune markers. Um, and so it's a little, little bit parallel, perhaps, with what my wife went through. Um, then 
my kids, you know, continued with full-time schooling, uh, but had to back off some of their extracurriculars uh, until 2016, uh, when as a fifth grader for my youngest, uh, a senior for my middle child and uh, in college for my oldest, uh, an illness went through the whole family. And um, it was a bad, bad head cold that moved into the chest and it triggered uh, full-fledged ME-CFS in all three of my kids and a decline in my wife, Debbie. Um, and so that was hard because I did not, I was definitely in denial. I didn't want to uh, accept that this was going on, but I was the, I was the coach of my uh, youngest son, um, both basketball and soccer. And he was the energizer bunny, uh, midfielder. And, um, and he kept, he started asking me, Hey, can I play, can I play goalie? Can I play goalie? Cause he was just getting so tired. And that was my first Rec I recognized at that point that something was going on. Um, so they got diagnosed. Uh, and in 2018, my wife started having significant orthostatic issues. And that was finally tested to be determined to be a uh, low blood, brain blood flow um, on tilting. My middle child also got diagnosed with that later. Um, in 2019, however, my oldest son recovered uh, and was able to transfer to UCSD and complete his degree there. So there's some good news. Um, and then of course, coming along with that, uh, an MCAS diagnosis for all of the three sick kids. Um, it seems like we collect comorbidities, you know, kind of like merit badges. Um, some of the challenges we've had uh, over the time, uh, doctors, I have to go with my wife to every doctor's visit. We call them dates. Um, and that's just in order to have doctors take her seriously. Um, you know, when we went to the early doctors uh, at UCSD, he, they showed us a differential that said, hey, if they're suffering these symptoms, send them to a psychiatrist. Um, when, my, when my kids were sick, we had Kaiser as our insurance and Kaiser refused to diagnose them with MECFS. We had to go outside and go to specialists to get that diagnosis. Um, School accommodations were always a challenge uh, as, as their illness progressed. You know, initially they were going part-time or we had to switch them to part-time and we had to get uh, that done through many meetings uh, where social services would be involved and they would be, of course, threatening us with truancy. And you know, there was always that uh, concern that uh, you know, we'd heard the bad stories about your kids getting taken away from you. Um, and I'm curious if MECFS caused by COVID is perhaps one of the increases in the cause, cause of the increases in school avoidance that we've heard about recently. Um, Social Security disability, of course, is a challenge getting through that. Um, they still use old policies from prior to the IOM report, where a psychologist is supposed to be used to evaluate the severity of the disease. For all those things that I just mentioned above, a biomarker or test ideally one that indicates severity would be really helpful. Um, whole genome testing had that done uh, when the price dropped below $1,000. Uh, ironically, that was filled with its own challenge because Veritas, the company we used, had a problem with their mitochondrial DNA pipeline where they compared it to the wrong reference. And that popped up a, a, you know, a normal haplotype as a pathogenic variant. Uh, so we had fun tracking down that uh, wild goose chase. All of our genomes have been supplied to um, Personal Genome Project, um, so they're available. Um, moving on. Some of the learnings. Uh, getting sick, avoid it. Uh, it can make uh, your MEC, current MECFS symptoms worse. Uh, and overall, this disease is strange, inconsistent, and hard for people who don't have it to understand. Different parts of the body and brain are impacted at different times. So sometimes my wife and kids can do one thing, and other times they can't. Sometimes they can do activity A, but they can't do it to what to me seems very similar activity B. Um, sleep, of course, is a challenge. Sleep initiation, particularly for my kids. They're tired but not sleepy, and so their sleep cycle shifts, and they end up having to go around the clock probably once every three months. Um, the energy interval, it's not marked. Knowing, you know, pacing is easy to say, but you're always challenged with where that limit is. And then sometimes in life, there's opportunities to make memories, to have a, a still a little bit of a life, even with this disease. And you know you're going to pay a short-term cost, but the question is, 
is there going to be a long-term cost? And finally, identifying those causal relationships um, is very difficult, especially for my family. My wife disconnects from her body to get through the day-to-day -day pain. And so when I'm trying to get feedback from her on whether a treatment is working, it can be difficult. And my kids, of course, are kids. They're inconsistent with their medications and feedback. Um, including thoughts. I'm preaching to the choir here, but MECFS needs a lot more research funding and a lot more research is just based on the disease burden and economic impact. Um, we need to actively work to reverse the incorrect messaging of the past decades. Um, and we need to make MECFS and other infection associated chronic conditions a subject in the medical education and on healthcare licensing tests so that physicians are made aware of this disease. Um, and finally, we need to produce a detailed research roadmap to encourage, guide, and coordinate new and existing researchers in the field. And that is hopefully what we will be working on more today. So thank you for your time. Thanks very much for your perspective. Your uh, experience is sadly similar to a lot of other uh, patients and parents of patients. Uh, so, um, I guess uh, I guess we will uh, move on to the next speaker. So the next speaker is Michael Peluso. Uh, Michael is an infectious disease uh, physician scientist at the medical school at the University of California, San Francisco, where he is assistant professor of medicine. Uh, he has research funding to study the HIV reservoir, but recently has done some important work concerning the persistence of SARS-CoV-2 that we'll be hearing about. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here with you. I just want to say before I start that I really agree with um, a lot of David's points, especially the importance of including um, these conditions in the sort of medical education training that we go through. Um, uh, it's just, it's like very important and um, there's not enough of that that we learn about in medical school and residency. Um, so yeah, as was mentioned, um, I'm an infectious disease physician and clinical researcher here at UCSF. And um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, sort of became interested in um, what might might have turned out to be the long-term uh, impact of um, of COVID and um, have been studying that for uh, the last three years. So I'm gonna to talk today about um, some work in viral persistence, but just to say that most of my experience um, in long COVID comes from our research program in San Francisco, which is called LINK, which stands for Long-Term Impact of Infection with Novel Coronavirus. and LINK launched really in the earliest days of the pandemic to understand what happened to people after they had COVID um, based on the assumption that it would probably be more complicated than it had been billed at, at the time as a two-week illness. So we opened our program in April of 2020 and within two weeks of opening the program um, began to encounter participants with what would now be called uh, long COVID, although we didn't have a name for it at that time. Um, we worked to sort of systematically record and bank specimens on people that we were seeing. Uh, and since that time have enrolled, actually at this point, nearly a thousand participants, conducted thousands of visits, um, done really detailed longitudinal phenotyping, uh, banked tens of thousands of specimens and supported dozens of collaborations. And uh, since early 2022, um, we've also been fortunate to be a part of the NIH's program, the national program called Recover, um, which is basically uh, really, really synergistic and um, asking complementary questions to what we've been doing in LINK, but just on a, a much greater scale, which I think is really important. Um, and so we're part of both programs. Um, so I'm going to begin um, with what we know, uh, and I'll touch briefly on ME in, in, in all of these sections, but talk mostly about long COVID. So we know that infection-associated chronic conditions are common. Um, I probably don't need to explain that to this audience. There's a really nice review paper um, from a couple of years ago looking at different um, conditions associated with various infections. ME is probably the prototypic and um, likely, you know, 
perhaps until long COVID, the most common, um, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit of, on ME long COVID overlap in a few slides, but lots of other, um, there are lots of other pathogens that cause infection associated conditions that we really don't understand all that well, um, uh, including gastrointestinal pathogens like Giardia, which is a, you know, a protozoal pathogen, um, other viruses um, like Ebola, which got a lot of attention about 10 years ago um, in the West African outbreaks, and we're still learning a lot from. And I, to me, the fact that all of these infection-associated conditions have overlap in their presentations really provides a lot of external validation that there must be some um, overlapping underlying biological mechanisms that we should be able to figure out. Lots of people are affected already. Um, this is a figure from a paper that Lisa McCorkle from the Patient-Led Research Collaborative and I published in Nature last month. Um, currently, they're estimated to be over 65 million people with long COVID right now. Um, the CDC estimates that there are 24 million people with um, pre-COVID ME. That's probably a low estimate, and that number is honestly probably closer to the 65 million with um, post-COVID uh, long COVID. Um, and, you know, if 5% of COVID cases over the next 10 years get long COVID, that's on par with um, current estimates of the burden of things like heart disease. And these numbers are already on the same level as other high priority medical conditions like cancer and stroke and Alzheimer's and HIV. So I don't think that people should really make the argument anymore that not enough people are affected for this to be important. That's clearly not the case. We know that ME often has an infectious trigger and the subsequent talks today will get into more detail on this, but just to say there are you know, multiple um, uh, you know, a series of ME outbreaks after um, nonspecific viral illnesses. Um, there's some controversy regarding whether multiple different pathogens can cause ME or there's a single or set of pathogens that can cause ME. Um, which is nicely outlined in Dr. Hansen's recent um, paper here. Uh, it's likely that enteroviruses, which again, we'll hear more about, are, are probably the biggest culprit. And there is evidence for enteroviral persistence, which I'll touch on. Um, but reactivation of DNA viruses like herpes viruses may also play an important role. So in my opinion, some but not all long COVID is similar to ME. There's a lot of symptomatic overlap, but there are also cases that appear to me uh, to be quite distinct. Uh, there are various estimates that you could find in the published literature uh, about long COVID ME overlap. I think they're all quite flawed um, because there are very few true epidemiologic population-based studies. They're usually just cohort studies. Um, we tried to sort of jerry-rig a ME case definition in LINK and our upper estimate for the participants in LINK who have um, ME overlap is about 18% among people who got COVID prior to ever being vaccinated. And there are other cohorts that have tried to do this, which have found a lower incidence, um, probably around 2 to 5%. Um, but actually, you know, this is a question that I think Recover is going to do a really nice job of trying to delve into um, because the cohort is so large and they followed many people. Um, from shortly after the time of infection. So um, it removes a lot of the sort of uh, biases that um, might exist in cohorts like LINK. And so I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll learn um, more about this from Recover. And my personal take on this um, is that there is post-COVID ME, but really at this point, uh, we need to consider this to be COVID-related ME because the attribution to SARS-CoV-2 may turn out to be very important um, because we actually know the infectious trigger uh, for sure in these cases. So I know this is a somewhat controversial area, um, but that's just my opinion on it um, for the time being. So we also know that the what happens during acute infections is really important in long COVID. And so these are some data from um, a CDC-sponsored study called Find COVID, which has been working closely with us in LINK for the last three years. Uh, and what they did in this analysis was they looked at viral shedding during the first three weeks after SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
um, and tested people basically every day. And what you can see here is that those who are destined to develop long COVID or PASC at four months um, have a longer duration, higher peak and um, longer duration of um, uh, both positivity and actual infectious virus um, on uh, cytopathic effect assays uh, than people who are destined to fully recover. So this suggests that what goes on even in the first couple of weeks can really affect people's long-term trajectory. And I think that this provides some mechanistic understanding, this other important clinical observation, which is that at least in some populations, um, early antiviral treatment really makes a difference in long-term outcomes. So these are data from the VA cohort um, that showed that antivirals for people who qualify in the first um, you know, five days of, of symptom onset um, changes both long COVID outcomes and other outcomes like heart attacks and diabetes and strokes and blood clots out to six months. Um, so I think that those two studies together really suggest that stuff that goes on early matters in the long term. But that's not really all that matters. Uh, so we know that there is precedent for persistence of RNA viruses. Um, this is a nice paper from Diane Griffin from Hopkins from last year uh, that basically explains why this might happen. Um, and so we typically think of these viruses as coming and going, but um, there's clear evidence that at least some of these viruses can persist beyond the acute phase uh, and can be recovered from people um, with, uh, with infection-associated chronic conditions. So people used to ask me as an HIV doctor at the beginning of the pandemic, what's the difference between HIV and SARS-CoV-2? And I would say HIV is a virus that persists, it integrates, it persists forever, and SARS-CoV-2 is transient, it should come and go. And I think that that framework has now sort of been challenged and is falling out of favor, at least in some cases. Um, this is a really nice review paper from Amy Proel, who's a microbiologist at the Polybio Research Foundation, um, where she cataloged all of the studies uh, over the last few years that have examined and found evidence for um, persistence of different components of SARS-CoV-2. And I'll touch on some of these uh, in the talk, but encourage you to check out this paper. I'm just waiting for it to advance. Um, so these stories actually began um, with a focus on populations that were immunocompromised. We knew from early on in the pandemic that some people shed virus for a long time and that um, particularly immunocompromised patients um, could shed virus even from their nose for a very long time. Uh, this is a really nice study that was done in Europe, um, looking at people with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, doing gut biopsies six months uh, after they had COVID, and they were able to identify SARS-CoV-2 RNA in a large proportion of people at six months. Interestingly, they couldn't culture the virus and they couldn't recover it from stool, and it was not related to the severity of the initial illness, but it seemed to be related to long COVID in the sense that um, a large proportion of people who had evidence of viral persistence reported post-acute um, symptoms, including GI symptoms, whereas those who did not have evidence of this generally did not have symptoms. So this was an early look that I think was really provocative, that there could be um, persistence, particularly in the GI tract. And then studies started to emerge looking at this in immunocompetent populations. So this was a paper from Michelle Nussenswag's group um, at the Rockefeller, Rockefeller that came out early in the pandemic, where they were looking at the evolution of B cell responses to COVID and the responses continued to evolve. And so they were looking for why this might be. And they, they found on staining again of gut biopsies um, that they thought that they were identifying components of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the GI tract of people who presumably felt fine. There's no clinical data about these, these individuals, um, but a really provocative finding. And then uh, many of you might be aware of this uh, really nice paper that came out from Dan Cherto's group at the NIH um, in Nature earlier this year, where they performed autopsies on people who died after COVID, not necessarily related to COVID. Um, and what you could see here on the right side of this figure is that they were able to identify 
SARS-CoV-2 RNA in a variety of tissues, including neurologic tissues, for up to six months post-COVID um, from people who died from other causes. So again, not a study of long COVID, but suggesting that um, this is a, a true phenomenon. So measuring tissues uh, is really hard, and there have been efforts to um, look for antigen or virus in more easily accessible spaces, particularly the blood. David Wald's group at Harvard has done a lot of important work in this area, and their first look at this um, was published in CID last year. David developed the single molecule array assay and then further developed it to look at SARS-CoV-2 antigens. Um, and they studied a, a pretty small cohort of about three dozen people um, with long COVID and found that a really high proportion um, had intermittent detection of full length spike in plasma for up to a year. Um, it's hard to draw a lot of conclusions from this paper because the sample size is very small. It was mostly people with long COVID. They didn't have um, good comparisons to people who recovered or to true negative samples. Um, and the clinical data were pretty limited, including a lot of people were tested um, after they had subsequently been vaccinated. Um, so hard to know whether this was really attributable um, to the infection. But after we saw this paper, um, we decided uh, uh, to develop a collaboration with David's lab, which has been really wonderful. Um, and so have been working to apply this assay to samples from Link. So what we did was um, we sent 250 pre-pandemic control samples. It is impossible for these people to have had COVID because the blood was collected in like 2015 to 2018. Um, and the, the blood was collected and processed in the same way by the same labs as 172 people post-COVID across 600 time points between 30 and 450 days post-infection. And really importantly, the vast majority of these um, samples, the blood came out of a person's arm before a vaccine ever went into them. And we did the same, same exact assay in David's lab. And what we found is quite... Um, quite striking, uh, the false positive prevalence in the pre-pandemic samples was 2%, so it was very low. And we clearly found um, increased prevalence of detectable antigen in plasma um, during all of the post-acute time periods up to as far as we looked, which was at 14 months. Um, even more compelling to me was that there was a relationship with the severity of the initial illness. So people who had been hospitalized for COVID were twice as likely to have this than people who had not been hospitalized. And even among those who were not hospitalized, those who self-reported that they were very, very sick um, during the acute phase of COVID were four times as likely to have it as people who self-reported mild infections. Um, so that um, is plausible to me. And so I really believe that this is happening in a subset, a subset, not everybody, uh, of people. So the summary of this section, what we know, we know that infection-associated chronic conditions are common, um, that both ME and long COVID uh, are likely to have infectious triggers. What happens during the acute phase of those infectious triggers probably matters, but um, that um, components of these pathogens um, probably persist in some people beyond the acute phase. So what we don't know and what we need to know, most importantly, is antigen persistence responsible for these conditions or is it just something that is happening? Um, so the subsequent speakers will talk more about antigen persistence in ME, but just to say um, there are similar work from 10 to 15 years ago, looking at gut biopsies um, and identifying what is thought to be persistent enterovirus um, in the GI tract of a subset of people with ME. Uh, and we're very interested in this in long COVID. So I mentioned this uh, initial paper from David Waltz group last year. They really only evaluated um, the most kind of severe cases of long COVID in that people were presenting for clinical care, and they didn't really study people who had fully recovered from, from COVID. So really hard to draw conclusions. There are a lot of other small studies that have tried to draw conclusions. So this is some work from Naveet uh, Dillon's group um, in Kansas, uh, which did DDPCR and spike ELISAs in blood of people within and without long COVID. You can see here that the groups are quite small. Um, but it seems that there is some signal where this is more likely to be detected 
in people with long COVID, although very difficult to draw firm conclusions given the, the small sample. And then on the right is a study, another study from Europe, um, looking at circulating S1 in people prior to vaccines, um, where they found that the proportion of people with ongoing long COVID where this was detected was about 60%, and that was about twice as high than in people who had fully recovered from COVID. But again, the sample was so small um, that they couldn't really draw firm conclusions from this. But that's, to me, quite a provocative observation. So as you can imagine, we are now um, uh, you know, interested in looking at this in, in, in LINK. Um, we did an early study uh, about a year and a half ago in collaboration with Ed Getzel uh, at UCSF, where we looked at participants in LINK with and without neuropsychiatric long COVID, so who had COVID, post-COVID anxiety, depression, um, and other neuro uh, and neurocognitive symptoms. We looked three months post-COVID at um, proteins found in exosomes, which are little sort of packaged vesicles um, that are derived from different cell types in the body. So we looked at exosomes that are thought to be derived from neurons and astrocytes um, in this study. And what we found to me, again, was really striking. So there was some background false positive rate in pre-COVID controls. Those who had, co uh, had COVID but fully recovered um, had more uh, detection of spike in these exosomes. Those who had long COVID but no neurologic symptoms had a higher level. And then the highest level was found in those with long COVID with neurologic symptoms. So again, this was a small study, about 40 people, um, but a really provocative observation. But not all of the studies are positive. So this is a recent study from a really well-regarded group in Sweden, um, where they looked at people with neurocognitive long COVID um, and looked in both plasma and spinal fluid and basically found no evidence of antigen persistence um, in this cohort. Now, that being said, if you look at the sample size, there were 25 people with long COVID and six without long COVID. And if you apply the prevalence um, proportions that I talked about at the beginning that we're seeing in LINK, you would actually only expect one or two people in the study to have this. So I think it's a negative study, but doesn't necessarily prove, um, prove the negative. So, um, as I mentioned in this collaboration with David Walt, we're now looking at this um, in LINK. Uh, and so in that same cohort that I showed um, at the beginning, we also have um, detailed long COVID symptom data. Uh, and in this cohort, there's uh, about half of the cohort has sort of moderate, at least moderate long COVID. And about thir a third of the cohort had COVID but fully recovered. Um, and so we're applying those same assays to see if we can see a signal. And we're starting to see something, I think. So um, we see that antigen persistence in the post-acute phase is most common in the most symptomatic long COVID cases. Um, so about 40% of people with a lot of symptoms over time, you know, more than nine symptoms over time seem to have this, it's not 100%. Um, but 40% is a fairly sizable proportion. Um, but we're also seeing it in some people who say that they are totally fine. Um, and so uh, it's, you know, again, about twice as common in people who are really severely affected, but um, it's not unique to that group. Um, and so my take on this is that it may be more common in people who are more symptomatic, but it can be detected even in people who have um, who have fully recovered. Uh, this is a sample size of about, again, 170, and so we really need to um, scale it up. And I think uh, the next slide will illustrate why, which is that we're actually able and linked to look at the relationship between antigen persistence and specific long COVID symptoms. Um, and the takeaway here is that all of the point estimates are on the right side of the line, um, which is that uh, basically, all of these symptoms are uh, more common in people with evidence of antigen persistence, but all of them currently cross the line. So none of these are statistically significant observations yet. Um, there are some that appear to be approaching significance already, uh, and so we're building out this analysis now to try to see whether we can 
um, confirm that there's an association between antigen persistence and any specific um, long COVID symptoms. Uh, based on this work, you know, we don't think that the answer to everything is going to be in the blood. And so we launched a gut biopsy program about a year and a half ago where we're performing flexible sigmoidoscopies in people um, with long COVID. And what we actually do is um, we take pre-pandemic control tissue samples and mount them on the same slide as the post-COVID um, patient sample. And then we do um, RNA scope and then um, various immunohistochemical stainings and mounting everything on the same slide eliminates the potential for batch effects. Um, so I'll show you some of our preliminary data from this project. So what you're seeing, so um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA would be in green on this slide. Uh, so what you're seeing in the two control participants at the top and the bottom is no green. So there's no background staining in, in these participants. But then on the adjacent tissue section from people with long COVID, um, there's a lot of green. So the top participant is a person with long COVID who's six months post-COVID. Um, the bottom is a person with long COVID who's two years post-COVID. In both of these cases, there is no known re-exposure or reinfection. The signal is all located in the lamina propria, which is sort of the underlying connective tissue layer rather than the epithelium. Um, and what's really interesting is that it appears to be um, concentrated in these areas that are dense with CD68 um, staining, which is a, a myeloid lineage marker. So it suggests that there's monocyte or macrophage activation, more so than lymphocyte activation in these cases. So um, on the initial five biopsies we did, we had similar findings from this in four of the five. We did 18 more biopsies over the last four months um, as part of this initial project. Um, and that's all going through the analytic pipeline right now. Um, we should have results next year. Um, and we're now studying people who have fully recovered to see whether this is specific to long COVID or not. Um, so there's a whole other talk that can be done on how antigen persistence causes long COVID, but there are you know, a variety of other mechanisms that have been in invoked in long COVID, things like inflammation, immune dysregulation, EBV reactivation, microbial translocation, dysbiosis, clotting, autoimmunity. The reason that viral persistence is so attractive to me is that it, it could exist upstream of all of these things and be sort of the most proximal driver of everything that um, subsequently happens. And so um, I'll just touch on a, a couple of points that I think are really important um, in terms of how this could actually cause disease. So the first is really, really interesting work um, that's come out of the Gladstone Institute here at um, in San Francisco from Katerina Casablo's group. She's a neuroscientist um, looking at the, the molecular interaction between spike protein and fibrinogen, where spike protein actually ch conformationally changes the fibrinogen, makes it more likely to uh, polymerize as fibrin. And that's a mechanistic explanation for why people might have um, these microclots that have been, um, you know, found by Roger Pretorius's group in South Africa. Um, so this spike fibrin interaction and then the relationship between fibrin and microglial activation is very, very um, interesting to me and I think is going to turn out to be important. And then many of you will be aware of this really nice paper from Mayan Levy's group at Penn um, that came out in Cell last month. We contributed link samples um, to this analysis and they basically invoked how viral persistence in the gut, for example, could interfere with tryptophan absorption and serotonin metabolism, um, resulting in changes in vagus nerve stimulation and potentially causing um, some neurocognitive symptoms of long COVID. So viral persistence to me is upstream of a lot of these mechanisms. So in uh, summary of this section, we know that um, antigen persistence, um, we need to know if antigen persistence can cause long COVID in at least some people. Uh, and we need to know why this could occur. So why does antigen persist? Is it because of immune escape? Um, is it because of a local microenvironment that prevents immune surveillance? Um, and then how does viral persistence cause downstream effects? And then ultimately what we need to know is does treating persistent SARS-CoV-2 infection result in improvement? And that's uh, that's a really, really important question. 
Um, so there are three, to me, there are really three or four research priorities. The first is better biomarkers, as, as was mentioned by David at the beginning. Um, so the current biomarkers are great, but there are a lot of limitations. It's unclear what level of sensitivity is needed. It's unclear how specific these measurements are. Many of the positive values are just above the assay limit. So there's concern that we need more sensitive assays. It also might be that the timing of the assay matters because we don't see this consistently in the same people over time, um, which suggests that it may be related to sporadic release related to like a meal or stress or a hormone cycle or something. Um, and then uh, we need better tissue-based markers as well, but these are really um, you know, sort of limited in availability and accessibility. This is so important because going back, you know, putting back on my HIV hat, before plasma HIV RNA existed, which is the you know viral load that we measure in blood, which we totally take for granted now, the primary endpoints of clinical trials for HIV treatment trials um, really relied on observing a lot of people for a long amount of time to see any benefits. So um, these studies took a really long time to get answers and were really, really labor intensive. And it prevented a lot of early investment in HIV research. But once this was validated as a biomarker, all of these endpoints vanished and there was just this explosion of investment and development of therapeutics for HIV. And now we have, you know, dozens of HIV drugs um, that we can offer our patients. And that's really because of um, the impact that good biomarkers had. Uh, and so we, we need better biomarkers for, for long COVID. Tissue studies are also going to be really important. That includes looking at areas that are fairly easily accessible in living people. Um, and so we are launching a large tissue program here at UCSF that's um, supported by the PolyBio Foundation and is going to be looking at gut, lymph node, CSF, and, and bone marrow tissue. Um, and that'll be starting next year, but um, not all tissue tissue is accessible in um, you know in living people, and it, it's going to be really important to have good autopsy studies. Um, you know, as you may know, Recover is running an autopsy cohort that I think is going to be really really important in figuring this out. Um, and I I don't think that the you can't really overemphasize the uh, the importance of um, tissue based studies because I think. A lot of us really think that this is going to turn out to be a tissue-based phenomenon. And then the last thing that I really believe we need is more experimental medicine. I'm not talking huge randomized control trials. Um, I'm talking of, of foundational proof of concept work. And so when I talk about experimental medicine, what I mean is that you identify a pathway, viral persistence, uh, that you think is causing uh, downstream effects in people with a condition. And then in a controlled manner, the controlled aspect of this is very important. Um, you try to disrupt that pathway uh, using drugs that are easy, easily accessible. Um, uh, and you study people really, really intensively. And the purpose of this is to probe whether manipulating that pathway actually has a downstream effect be great if it was a slam dunk and it had a downstream effect on symptoms. But even if you can change the levels of different biological markers, that could be really, really important to learn. Um, and so there are some experimental medicine studies going on now, but not nearly enough. And we've identified a variety of different pathways. Um, and so I, I really think we need more investment in these sort of phase two type clinical trials, um, which can be launched and implemented um, relatively quickly um, uh, to, to probe these pathways. Uh, we launched at UCSF in LINK an experimental medicine program uh, this summer. The first trial that we were doing is of a SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal um, developed by a biotech company called Arium Therapeutics, which is based in Boston. Um, this is um, funded by the Patient-Led Research Collaborative with additional support from PolyBio. And what we're doing in this study is we're taking 30 people with long COVID attributed to a variant that the monoclonal would be thought to work against. So before September of last year um, and doing a blinded study, uh, two to one randomized where people get a single infusion of this monoclonal and then be followed really, really closely over time with lots of different measurements. 
Uh, this is a phase two study. So the primary primary outcome is safety. Monoclonals have never been in a, a randomized trial given to people with long COVID. Um, but we're measuring a lot of patient reported outcomes as well as objective outcomes um, like neuro neurocognitive testing, um, six minute walk test. And then layered on top of this is additional studies of viral persistence with things like gut biopsy, lumbar punctures, um, imaging studies. Uh, so we've nearly completed recruitment for this study, and we're expecting that it'll read out at the end of next year. There are other really important studies evaluating virus persistence. There are three studies in the US of Paxlovid that I'm aware of, smaller studies at Stanford and Yale, and then a large study um, called VITAL, which is going to be taking place within the Recover Initiative. And I think these are going to be really important. Um, I'm particularly excited about the one that's going to be happening via Recover because it is large enough that it will be able to study different phenotypes of long COVID. Um, and I think that that's going to be really important because it may be that virus persistence only drives certain subtypes of long COVID. And then we at UCSF, our, our second experimental medicine study will be an antiviral study of the um, Shinogi antiviral called Encitrovir, and that'll start next year. So summary of this section, how are we going to find this out? We need better biomarkers. We need more funding for large, really carefully designed studies of viral persistence, particularly studies that can leverage specimens that were banked before things got really complicated with vaccines and reinfections and lack of testing and all these other circulating infections going around. We need more tissue studies and autopsy studies, and we need more investment in experimental medicine. And then just to say, um, Lisa McCorkle and I were given the opportunity to comment on this um, in Nature last month, and um, I encourage you to check out this this commentary, which is arguing um, this case, basically more investment in both clinical and research infrastructure, um, uh, continued coordination of the research agenda, um, uh, and more investment in clinical trials. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's too much negativity around what has been accomplished in terms of understanding long COVID over the last three years. Um, and I think people really need to understand that we, we've actually generated a substantial amount of momentum um, that needs to be sustained. Uh, so in conclusion, I believe that long COVID is, is really our best chance to figure out an infection-associated chronic condition. Um, I hope that there will never be another opportunity in our lifetime to do this. I hope that there will never be another pandemic of this scale. Um, I think a, a really clear research agenda has emerged around the concept of viral persistence as an upstream cause of all of the other pathways that have been invoked in long COVID. And we really need more investment specifically targeting this pathway. Um, and I think that the answers that we find in long COVID are really important because um, the hope is that these will then be translatable um, to, to sort of um, you know, further jumpstarting research in ME to better understand um, the drivers of, 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 of non-COVID ME. So I'm going to end there with some acknowledgments. Um, I want to acknowledge the uh, other PIs of um, both our local program and our recover program, um, foundation funding from Polybio and Patient-Led Research Collaborative, um, the NIH, um, including um, including recover, and of course our our volunteers and our community advisory board. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Michael, for a really excellent presentation. Um, so there's several questions in the Q&A that I will um, read out. I would also encourage any of the panelists to raise their hands and I'll call on you. Um, but let's start with um, some of the questions in the in the Q&A. Um, so I think you, you did cover this, whether your research includes people post-vaccine. I thought that those the significantly large decrease in the number of people with long COVID was pretty striking. Do you want to comment more on that, Dr. Peluso? Yeah, so, you know, the majority of our cohort was enrolled pre-vaccine. And so I, I do think that we saw a lot of, a lot more long COVID um, in that era. But, you know, we have gone through this exercise where sort of each breakthrough in COVID when vaccines were developed, when Omicron happened and may have been mild, milder, 
um, when antivirals came out, at each stage, people have sort of declared that this is going to be the solution to long COVID, you know, including post-COVID ME. And I know plenty of people with who got vaccinated and got COVID and subsequently got long COVID. I know plenty of people who had Omicron and got long COVID. I know plenty of people who got treated with antivirals and got long COVID. So even though it might be less common, it's it has not gone away. Um, we do not have a specific, I, I wasn't sure if you were asking about sort of vaccine injury. We don't have a specific yeah. program around that, but um, there are groups that are investigating that. Um, and I, you know, I think it's a important and relevant question. Right, thanks. So the, the next question is something that we talk about a lot. So, um, and it being part of the discussions in recover on the NIH side, we've discussed this a lot, how, how to compare individuals with who've had COVID and long COVID with individuals who've had ME-CFS for decades. Um, I mean, it, it, it's really a challenge to think about are we comparing apples and oranges when we do the would think about doing those kinds of studies? Yeah. Would you comment on that, Michael? Uh, it's a that is a really important point. And the fact that we're at least acknowledging the point up front, I think, is is also important. Um, that's sort of part of the reason why I think it's, you know, there are sort of lumpers and splitters in all areas of medicine. Um and I think that the field of understanding for long COVID is still at the point where we really need to be splitters um, and sort of think about groups differently. Um, uh, I, you know, I think um, there's also an, you know, there's a subset of people who had ongoing ME or had ME and got better and then subsequently got COVID relapsed. And I think that that's also another really important um, thing to study because there might be clues to both conditions in studying such individuals. Mm -hmm. I think the power of cohorts that are as large as recover, um, you know, 15,000 people in contrast to smaller cohorts, like our local cohort, is that there you need to build up substantial numbers of people of, of those types of phenotypes. And um I, yeah, I think um, looking at all of those groups is going to be really important, but I don't have a good solution to the the problem that you mentioned. Thanks. So Nancy, I see your hands raised. Would you like to unmute and ask a question? Michael, that was really a splendid talk. Thank you very much. I was wondering, as an HIV guy who is doing long COVID, um, could you talk about the role of co-infection and what do you think the data is with this EBV during primary or reactivation of EBV might have to do with um, yeah. the activation of COVID? Well, yeah, so uh, yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, again, going back to David's comments at the, the beginning, you know, I did medical training in the U.S. and we are really conditioned to be quite dismissive of herpes virus activations outside of specific, extremely immunocompromised contexts. And this has really made me revisit that framework. Um, there are now three or four studies that have looked at this from different angles, um, initially from um, Jason Goldman and Jim Heath in Washington, a uh, study from us in San Francisco, a study from Sinai and Yale, Akiko Asaki's group, that all show this basically similar findings, which is that um, either direct or indirect evidence of EBV reactivation likely during the acute phase of COVID um, seems to be more common among a subset of people with long COVID. In, in our study, we see strong relationships between early antigen D IgG, so suggestive marker of reactivation and specifically fatigue, not other symptoms, specifically fatigue. Um, and we see um, a relationship between very high level EBV responses overall and neurocognitive symptoms. And I think that this is an incredibly important thing to delve into because there's been so much progress made in understanding the relationship between EBV and other conditions like MS over the last five years. Um, I think that there is something here to be found. Now, that does not mean that I think that the current treatments for EBV would necessarily work. Um, and I don't typically um, prescribe EBV um, treatment to 
to my patients. Um, and I've heard that for a subset of people, it does work. And there's some nice work in ME that was done maybe 10 years ago, suggesting that there might be some signal there. Um, but I, I think that that looking at herpes virus reactivations in long COVID is going to be really, really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one minute left, so I'll, I'll ask a quick question. Are you doing genetic analysis of the individuals um, in link? Uh, yeah, so um, we've we we are not geneticists, but we have contributed uh, to several genetics uh, analyses, including whole genome sequencing analyses. Um, people have to opt into that, so not everybody wants to do it. Um, and then just to say, you know, uh, that's uh, enrolling people in Recover, that's also an option that people can opt into as part of Recover. People don't, I don't think, get their individual data back, but I think um, these genetic analyses are going to be really important. And there's some good work already looking at asymptomatic COVID and genetic markers, and there's a preprint looking at long COVID and genetic markers. So I, I think that we will learn from that, but can't change genetics. Um, so- No, but uh, it might tell us, some, give us information about who has genetic susceptibility. For sure, yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks again so much, Michael. It was really- Yeah, thanks for letting me be a part of this. Thank you. All right, I'll turn it back to you, Maureen, for your presentation. Okay, thanks. I have to share my screen. Okay, can you see my title slide? Yes, we can. Okay, okay so... Um, so I'm talking about uh, chronic infection, ME-CFS, uh, avoiding the herpes viruses, which are going to be the subject of the next talk. I'd like to say that I had not seen Michael Peluso's uh, presentation before, but it's very interesting how it resonates with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, one thing that I could tell him is that we did publish a paper a few years ago, uh, Arnaud Germain and myself, with an estimate that the worldwide prevalence of ME at that time was 65 million, which is uh, very close to what we're uh, hearing is the prevalence of long COVID. Uh, the other thing that I would like to, to say about his talk resonating with mine is that he mentioned that he thinks we should be referring to COVID-related ME uh, and not just conflate the two. And I will uh, I agree with that, and I will uh, mention more about that in my talk. So uh, when I will be, these are what we were asked to do. We were asked to talk about what we know and what we don't know. What I'm going to actually say is that I think some of the things we think we know, we might not actually know, and that we need to learn whether what we think is correct or not. So I'm going to start by saying, what. Which pathogens have been associated with the onset of what I'm going to call pre-2020 MECFS? This list of pathogens shows ones that have been published in various papers or uh, describing you know, that they were related to the onset of pre-2020 MECFS. There's some additional uh, pathogens that I feel there's inadequate information or there's disagreement in the literature. Uh, including mold, born a, born a disease virus, and Borrelia species. But all these species on the left, they, they've been associated with onset of pre-2020 MECFS. And which of these pathogens associated with pre-2020 MECFS can cause long-term infection? Well, in fact, it's the same list. All of these pathogens are known to be able to cause long-term infection. But... If you ask which pathogens associated with pre-2020 MECFS have not definitively been shown to cause a syndrome that includes post-exertional malaise, we have a list of most of those pathogens. So studies on these pathogens as causal for chronic fatigue syndrome have actually used rather weak diagnostic criteria. And so whether you think these pathogens are causal of, of chronic fatigue syndrome depends on your definition of chronic fatigue syndrome. So I, I really feel that loose chronic fatigue syndrome diagnostic criteria result in conflating multiple types of chronic infections or other illnesses. 
One of the more notorious criteria is the Oxford criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, in which fatigue is the principal symptom. Uh, it is, it has to be disabling and has to be present for six months. And, but other symptoms don't have to be present and particularly post-exertional malaise doesn't have to be present, but not even uh, myalgia or sleep disturbances. So, uh, so this is a really vague criterion and many different diseases could fit in this definition. And then there's the 1994 FACUDA criteria, which was somewhat better. It required, again, a minimum of six months of symptoms. It also, however, did not require post-exertional malaise. You had to have any four of the symptoms that I'm listing here, but uh, post-exertional malaise could be one of these, but it didn't have to be one of these. So I think as a result of this, you can also include illnesses on that list, uh, known chronic illnesses that uh, would fit the FACUDA criteria that I don't believe should be called MECFS. Uh, the controversy over what should be called ME or MECFS has gone on for quite a long time. And I just show a few uh, examples here of, of people opposing vague definitions. Uh, so for I'm not going to read everything here. People can read this quicker than I can say it, but I will say the introduction of chronic fatigue syndrome to designate ME does nothing to indicate the unique epidemiological, geographical, clinical, and laboratory findings in ME and can only add to the confusion. That was 1988 by a major uh, ME researcher. And then Melvin Ramsey, who is famous as the uh, person who presided over the 1955 uh, outbreak of ME says that uh, this post viral fatigue syndrome uh, it covers conditions such as post influenza debility or the more severe post infectious mononucleosis fatigue state. And these are in contrast to the three cardinal features of ME, which is a unique form of muscle fatigability whereby even after a minor degree of physical effort, three or more days elapse before muscle power is restored the extraordinary variability or fluctuation of symptoms and the alarming chronicity. So uh, this controversy has gone on for a long time. And I think that a very valuable uh, exercise that was done somewhat similar to this roadmap exercise was done in 2015. A year's worth of study resulted in the IOM MECFS diagnostic criteria. And these IOM criteria for, uh, for MECFS, what we now call MECFS as a compromised name, uh, is now requires post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep, and new fatigue of more than six months, and either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. And I think using a definition like this is, uh, as well as the Canadian consensus criteria or the international consensus criteria, that all require post-exertional malaise will give us a much uh, better uh, definition that, that of a more uniform illness that we can then study. So uh, I wanna give an example of the importance of the consistent criteria for selection of subjects because finding molecular biomarkers are going to be very difficult when multiple post-acute infectious syndrome cases are combined. And uh, one issue is that a number of MECFS clinicians are likely to see patients who have a variety of chronic infections or post-acute infection syndromes. And now to this list, we're adding uh, long COVID. But this is an interesting uh, table that was in a letter to editor uh, published by uh, uh, John Chia and his son, and in which he, they looked at 200 patients and what those that showed up with what apparently seemed to be chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, a full 18, 18 of those patients turned out to have a chlamydia pneumonia infection that was treatable. So, uh, so that, you know, that's very important. Then they all, and there were some patients with herpes virus infections here that were also treatable. And, um, but what was quite fascinating is that by far the majority of the people who showed up with the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms uh, had a very high levels of antibodies to enteroviruses. And there were, of course, some that you couldn't identify their cause as well. But this really shows that if you took this batch of patients and you tried to find a molecular marker 
that was common to all of these 200 people who could be defined as having chronic fatigue syndrome by either the FACUDA or the Oxford criteria, what are your chances of finding something that uh, will really define that group? This is really the importance of the consistent criteria for selection of subjects. There are uh, other sources of diversity that you can't do anything about. For example, especially the genome of the subjects. There's no way you can control for that. People are going to have co-infections uh, with various herpes viruses, potentially with HIV and, and other, um, other persistent infections. Uh, of course, sex is a, a, a variable and the gut microbiome. There's also the environment, the diet and the drugs. So with all those other aspects of diversity, we should at least have a, de a defined illness that uh, doesn't encompass any, any post-acute infection syndrome. So all of these pathogens are known to cause post-acute infection syndromes that likely don't fulfill the IOM or other PEM requiring definitions, although some of them have actually not been investigated carefully to see if they do. But uh, but many of these, there are patients who do not fulfill the IOM criteria. And I believe that then these should not be described as chronic fatigue syndrome, nor as MECFS. Instead, they should be, for example, described as chronic Q fever or chronic toxoplasmosis or uh, uh, chronic SARS-CoV-2, in other words, long COVID. So once a uh, very, uh, uh, a famous study is the Dubbo study from Australia, and this has convinced many that multiple pathogens can cause chronic fatigue syndrome, but I would like to point out that this study did not require PEM in the subjects, and they studied three infections. They had, they had 253 patients with, who had uh, acute onset of uh, mononucleosis, Q fever, or Ross River virus, and at 12 months, 9% of these patients met the FACUDA criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. But what other viruses might have stealthily arrived during that time, especially the patients who had EBV? And I'm going to get to that point later. But I don't believe that this study should be used to say that any pathogen can cause, uh, any of these pathogens can cause chronic fatigue syndrome because it depends. It, it, uh, if you if, unless you have a very loose definition of what chronic fatigue syndrome is. So if all pre-2020 MECFS is caused by an acute infection, then why do only about two-thirds of patients mention a preceding infection? Well, the fact is a large proportion of enteroviral infections are asymptomatic. And I think one benefit of information that's coming out of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is just how often infections with RNA viruses can be asymptomatic. It's to the advantage of the virus to not cause a symptomatic infection because then you go around and eat out uh, in a restaurant, go to a conference and infect other people because you don't even know you were ill. Now, when people search for an explanation, they might suspect an event that, search, uh, that occurred around the time of falling ill. Now, if, they're, if they don't have an acute illness around the time of falling ill, what would they, they have to come up with some explanation. So many people will say, oh, I had a car accident. I had some mental trauma. I, I was exposed to some terrible chemicals or some mold or some other environmental exposure. Now, the fact is that these could factor into why someone has acquired MECFS because these are all known to affect your immune system. But it's quite possible that people had asymptomatic infections with something, an intervirus or something else, and that is why they acquired MECFS. In my opinion, all MECFS is going to turn out to be uh, post-viral. Now, a striking number of patients mention a herpes virus infection, especially EBV, after which they weren't well. But Here's the problem. What asymptomatic or even symptomatic viruses might have affected them either shortly before or after they became ill with mononucleosis? Now, this is especially an issue given the protracted recovery period that occurs following EBV infection in some people, even ones who get completely well. So I think, I think that uh, we're going to hear more about herpes viruses but I also think that we don't have information that's sufficient for us to conclude 
that EBV or other herpes viruses can be by themselves uh, the viruses that incite ME-CFS. A major point that I'd like to make is that post-acute in infection syndromes that result in post-exertional malaise cannot be caused by any pathogen. There are pathogens that cause chronic infections that do not cause post-exertional malaise. So which pathogens are known to cause post-acute infection syndromes that do include post-exertional malaise? Right now, we've got enteroviruses, SARS-CoV-2, and maybe herpes viruses. We'll hear more in the next talk. But, and this list may not be uh, complete. We, there may be other viruses that we don't know about that indeed are also causing uh, uh, post-exertional malaise and, and a post-acute infection syndrome that we would call MECFS. But right now, these are the only ones that, that we can really conclude uh, uh, fit the MECFS definitions that include PEM. So this was... Um, this is something I like to bring up because we've heard the abundant funding and uh, activity uh, that's going on right now in, in long COVID studies. So can study of pre-2020 MECFS be replaced by studies of long COVID that fulfill the 2015 IOM criteria? And, uh, and researchers such as Michael Peluso, in fact, are, are aware uh, of, of the difference between people with uh, PASC and long COVID that fulfill the criteria. So I agree with him completely that the similarity in symptoms suggests that some of the same molecular, biochemical, and physiological pathways are disrupted in both uh, syndromes. And that new treatments that provide symptomatic relief of long COVID may benefit patients with pre-2020 MECFS. However, if pre-2020 MECFS persists because of chronic infection, drugs that treat SARS-CoV-2 chronic infection will not treat pre-2020 MECFS unless those drugs affect all RNA viruses. And there are a small number of drugs that do affect multiple RNA viruses. And one of these is remdesivir. This is a, a nucleotide analog that confuses uh, the RNA virus when it's replicating. So it would work also on enteroviruses, but whether this would work on a chronic enter enteroviral infection, we don't know. I would also argue that if pre-2020 MECFS persistence involves molecular mimicry to enteroviruses, then the autoantigens will likely differ from the autoimmunity induced by SARS-CoV-2. And SARS-CoV-2, a coronavirus, doesn't share sequence similarity with enteroviruses. So we really do need to know something about pre-2020 MECFS. I would also say uh, that there could be some fundamental pathway disruption that differs between pre-2020 MECFS and long COVID. Uh, we are currently dismissing the differences at molecular lever, level or in symptom constellation as a result of the more recent development of long COVID in patients but we don't have supporting evidence for this. It's very difficult to get that supporting evidence, but, uh, but nevertheless, we, it's, it's, we can't assume that these differences are solely due to the difference in the length of time that people are ill. And uh, something that is alarming that I'd like to point out is that long COVID that fulfills the pre-2020 MCFS uh, with the uh, diagnostic criteria can't be distinguished by symptoms alone, uh, with exceptions such as loss of sense of smell. We don't see that in MECFS. What this means is that cases and outbreaks arising from pre-2020 MECFS, um, I see there's some typos in this uh, sentence here, but if, if there are a virus that causes pre-2020 MECFS, they are still out there and they can still cause cases and outbreaks, but we wouldn't know that this was happening because it would be assumed that it was actually SARS-CoV-2 causing long COVID. So we really need to be able to distinguish pre-2020 MECFS and long COVID because there could be a new outbreak of MECFS that we won't even know is happening. So how can we detect chronic enteroviral infections? Uh, one can do it by detection of viral nucleic acid, uh, detection of viral protein products, or transmission of virus or disease to susceptible cells or hosts. 
And this list, of course, is the same as uh, the list you would give for a persistent SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, uh, ordinary serological tests can sometimes be indicative if, if repeatedly showing high titers of anti-EV antibodies. And in that table I showed from John Chia, he was able to see that a lot of his chronic fatigue syndrome patients, some who had been ill, certainly more than that six months, still were having high uh, uh, antibody titers. And, and these tests are especially useful at the time of an outbreak, but unfortunately were not usually used uh, during the outbreaks. But a caveat on this um, use of serological tests is the fact that it's estimated by the CDC that 50, 15 to 30 million EV infections occur in the US each year, so that many healthy individuals will have high anti-EV antibodies from a recent acute infection. So it's difficult to uh, have perfectly negative controls in such an assay given the frequency of EV infections. So I think that it's really critical to have knowledge of the inciting pathogen if you want to search for evidence of chronic infection in MECFS. So what is the evidence that enteroviruses can cause MECFS? One thing is that the non-paralytic enteroviruses, polio being a paralytic enterovirus, the first Coxsackie virus was actually not discovered until 1947. Now, Melvin Ramsey, who is credited with, the name, uh, with coming up with the name myalgic encephalomyelitis, was aware of Coxsackie virus at the time of the 1955 Royal Free Hospital outbreak, but the technology then was not adequate to investigate non-polio enteroviruses. So the most evidence for enteroviruses as causes of MECFS break, uh, outbreaks and sporadic cases comes from studies that were done at the time of the many outbreaks in the 1980s and the early 1990s. And interestingly enough, most of this evidence comes from Scotland and England that I'm going to tell you about because this was actually not very well, in fact, hardly at all investigated in the US. And one question you might ask is, were these earlier cases ones that are of what's now called MECFS. And so from Melvin Ramsey's article, uh, he, uh, he says that abnormal muscular fatigability is the dominant clinical feature. I think uh, it's rather prescient for this uh, colleague of his to say there is a prolonged metabolic disorder in many patients which may be affecting cellular energy systems, which is something that people are now uh, investigating. And, um, Another paper at that, in that era is their symptoms were overwhelming fatigue made worse by exercise. It's one of the papers I will be mentioning. And um, extreme prolonged muscle fatigue after exertion. So this is definitely MECFS with post-exertional malaise. Now, before talking about these historical papers, I have to set the stage of what, what, what was our capability at that time. When did DNA sequencing of enteroviruses become possible? So just to remind people, Sanger sequencing was developed in 1977. And by the early 1980s, many academic and government labs could perform DNA sequencing. My lab was able to do this, but it was a cottage industry. You had uh, to do it in your own lab. You couldn't go to some facility. And then PCR was invented in 1983. And uh, although it was invented then, it really became uh, feasible to do in individual labs when commercial PCR machines became available in 1990. Now, because these centralized facilities for sequencing data were rare in the late 80s and early 90s, most researchers e used either northern blots to detect enteroviral RNA or did RT-PCR to amplify viral cDNA which was then visualized on gels and not often, but not often sequenced. So many of these pa old papers that I've been uh, reading to prepare this talk uh, did not do sequencing. And here's an example of this paper from Cunningham. This is a 1991 RNA slot blot. Um, uh, slot blots are still used, but just for those who don't know what they are, uh, you, you put, um, you know, your RNA in a device that, uh, that has slots and then 
the, uh, the device will allow you to uh, put an imprint of that RNA onto your filter paper, and uh, then you have it on the filter paper and you can hybridize with uh, a probe. And in this case, they hybridize with a positive strand probe uh, for, uh, for, an, for enterovirus, a generic uh, probe that, to a conserved region and a minus strand. And these are all the subjects that they probed here. And uh, this is again, muscle RNA. And you can see that subjects one, two, five, seven, eight, 14, 15, all had uh, both positive and negative strand uh, indication of uh, enterovirus, um, number seven in particular. And there was a positive control of a known uh, enterovirus put on this blot. Well, another thing that's interesting here is that the positive and negative strand amounts are approximately the same, which is not typical during an acute infection. In an acute infection, you, ex you expect a lot more positive strand. And here's another interesting paper, again, from muscle biopsy RNA by Gao et al. And to explain this, uh, the, that you would, you, when you would do a gel like this, you would uh, do PCR of a nuclear DNA as a control to make sure that your reverse transcriptase and PCR enzymes are working. And then um, uh, this is showing the uh, CFS. Uh, they, I'm going to use CFS if that's what the person referred to the disease. So uh, these are CFS muscle biopsies here that had were positive for uh, 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 PCR bands, and this is a positive intraviral control. Now, somebody can say, oh, that's just a band on a gel. That's not really uh, intravirus. So one, one thing short of sequencing that people did at the time is that they would then uh, take the, those bands, put them on a slot blot, and then hybridize with an EV probe. So you could demonstrate that there was actually sequence of, of uh, intravirus by hybridizing with an EV probe, and this, uh, this, uh, this is again a positive control. So all of these samples here, definitely those bands actually were enteroviral PCR products. Now, the other thing, of course, is that there were enteroviral antibodies detected in many reports of MECFS cases or outbreaks between 1970 and 1995. And uh, these papers a uh, review of these papers can be found in a review article that, that we wrote in 2021. Now, I'd like to give a, uh, discuss a selection of reports of detection of EV sequences in MECFS subjects. Now, there's, lot, there's three times as many as what I'm showing here. I'm just picking out a few uh, to, to point out. So there, and again, these, this is Scotland and, and, and England for the most part. Um, so I'm going to start with, so there's three reports here in which people found uh, sequences in serum, and I've got five reports in muscle. I want to talk about this Galbraith one because this was unusual in that they actually not only uh, detected EV sequence, but they actually were able to sequence them. So these are serum samples collected at a Scotland clinic between 92 and 94. And as I remember, there were a lot mentioned, there's a lot of outbreaks in the 80s and early 90s. So they were able to see um, a signal in 44 of 238 cases and three of 130 controls, uh, but they also sequenced a number of the positive cases and then made this phylogenetic tree. And you can see that the CFS patients uh, here are on one side of this, most of them are on one side of this phylogenetic tree. Um, and uh, this paper included this interesting uh, figure here that shows the sample taken uh, from serum uh, and, and compared it to a throat swab at the same time. And there were some small differences, but largely this, this PCR product in the serum and the throat swab are similar. But what's also interesting, a serum sample taken 10 months later had the same uh, viral sequence in it. But back then, uh, we didn't have the amazing uh, uh, tools that NIH has developed. Uh, so you didn't have a GenBank online, you didn't have BLAST. So you had to actually, if you wanted to find out what that was, that your sequence, you actually had to acquire a batch of CDs uh, and um, and then load them on your computer and use special software. But now it, uh, I copied that sequence 
put it into, into BLAST. And five minutes later, I got this uh, uh, information that this sequence, in fact, corresponds to Coxsackie virus A9. Uh, it's 94% identity. So, uh, so this, even, even though they knew it was an intervirus, they didn't know which one. I'm also now going to talk about a, a very interesting muscle study, this one by Lane. And uh, they uh, found intraviral sequences in RT-PCR products from muscle biopsies and again sequenced it. And they had 10 of 48 patient muscle biopsies PCR positive for intravirus and none of 29 controls. But what was particularly interesting about this paper is that they actually had these people exercise and uh, check them for how much lactate they produced. And they had um, of nine out of the 10 uh, people who had positive biopsies for uh, uh, intravirus actually had an abnormal, abnormally high lactate after a 15 minute exercise. And um, uh, this, is, this is actually a vertical drawing of the uh, uh, comparison of these uh, interviruses that were found to a reference, a, a reference uh, intervirus sequence here. This, they were comparing this to Coxsackie virus B3 strain Nancy. Now, this was isolated in 1949 in Connecticut from a woman. I have a suspicion what that woman's name might have been. So each one of these, uh, each, each one of these uh, sequences here, uh, the differences between those sequences and, uh, and the reference virus are shown. What I think is interesting about this study and the previous one is that you can't say this is due to contamination, that you, you contaminated your lab and your lab is full of enteroviruses because each, each one, most of these are different. There's only, there's only two of them, that, the, two of the patients who had the same virus. So I think you can't explain this away as just the laboratory was, was contaminated. So how do enteroviruses persist in human cells after the acute infection? And this is, there's actually a lot more known about this than there is about SARS-CoV-2. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's going to be some interesting parallels between what happens to SARS-CoV-2 as its resident and what happens in enterovirus. So persistence of enterovirus uh, has been studied a great deal in heart, pancreas, brain, and cell lines because it has a connection with type 1 diabetes and cardiomyopathy and post-polio syndrome. In, in all of those uh, uh, illnesses, there's evidence that enterovirus is uh, involved in inciting and can still be resident in individuals' tissues with those illnesses. And um, with regard to our first uh, presentation, What's interesting to me is that type 1 diabetes is associated with enteroviruses, as is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so one wonders if an enterovirus was involved in the testimony that we heard at the beginning. So in steady state infection, there are many cells that are infected, but there's a, a low viral replication. This results in a non-lytic phenotype. If there was a high viral replication, the cell would be likely to die and wouldn't be persisting. And you can also end up with double-stranded viral RNA due to equal presence of positive and negative strands that was shown in that slot plot that I showed earlier. And it's been by a number of studies of these people, uh, hearts and pancreas, has shown that, and also cell cultures, mice, have shown that steady state infections with enterovirus results from defective viruses, and especially five prime uh, terminal deletions in this untranslated region that then affect replication. And if you're interested to know more about this, uh, you can. There are some recent papers showing these deletions in acute people with acute myocarditis and cardiomyopathy, as well as you know many other illnesses. So my feeling is that we need uh, to analyze tissues, and this is something that. Um, Michael Peluso also said in the connection with long COVID, we need to be analyzing tissues to determine whether the incidence of, uh, what, the, what is the incidence of chronic enteroviral infection in present day samples. Now, now I've been presenting the idea that 
chronic uh, intraviral infection is involved in ME-CFS, but we don't know if it's involved in every case. We don't know if, for example, there, the intervirus has uh, an intervirus infected someone, did some damage that we don't know about, or made some changes, or, uh, and, and those changes are what is causing ME-CFS, or whether, in fact, it is the continuing presence of uh, enteroviruses. So studies of other diseases have used tissue extracts, and these tissue extracts, especially have been heart, gastro gastrointestinal tract, the pancreas, and the central nervous system. And um, we heard again in our first talk that gastrointestinal tract is being investigated in, in, uh, in, in uh, looking at uh, long COVID. Now, there was a paper that appeared in uh, 2023 uh, doing a, a virome analysis of blood, feces, and saliva. And enteroviruses in this paper were not found in plasma of 285 MECFS cases, uh, nor in control individuals. Uh, now, what's interesting about that is that this is a different result than those early 90s papers that I showed earlier, in which they were able to find virus and serum I have no uh, way of, I have no reason to doubt that this recent study isn't correct. Um, and uh, I have no reason to doubt that the old study isn't correct. And I don't know how to rationalize these two uh, disparate findings. But one possibility, of course, is that the viruses that were um, infecting people in the early 90s, uh, again, they, those individuals have probably not been as sick as long as most of the individuals in this study. So we, we don't, we, I, I have no explanation for this. And it's something that needs to be examined further. Uh, it's evident also that um, PBMCs or feces are also not a great thing to use to look for chronic enteroviral infection. I suspect that if you were to look at people with dilated cardiomyopathy, you might not find any enteroviruses in PBMCs or in feces. Uh, in saliva, there was one case and one control that had rhinovirus, and rhinoviruses are a member, a member of the enterovirus. So at least that sort of was a positive control that this technology could uh, identify enteroviruses. But this, this uh, study, to my mind, brings home the fact that we need tissue analyses in MECFS to find out whether there are still uh, a proportion of individuals who have uh, both, um, uh, who have chronic enteroviral infection. Now, stomach uh, tissue is likely a suitable sample. And this was mentioned by Michael Peluso, the papers of John Chia. And just to mention one of his papers briefly, he had 165 consecutive CFS cases and 22 normal controls who went uh, underwent uh, biopsies and uh, then immunochemistry with uh, histochemistry was performed with an anti EV monoclonal antibody. And 135 of the 165 CFS samples, as well as some of the controls, were positive for the presence of a viral protein. And in addition, there were some uh, samples that were studied and were found to have interviral RNA as well. And uh, this study here that I will also briefly mention uh, is uh, one in which uh, three patients who arrived with an acute enteroviral infection later had evidence of persistent infection and in fact developed MECFS. And so here's a stomach biopsy reacted with an anti-VP1 antibody, the viral protein capsid uh, protein. And you can see that uh, there's a lot present in that stomach biopsy, the brown here, and a control with an anti-CMV antibody in which you don't see this. So um, what indirect evidence can be used to, uh, to suspect chronic infection in MECFS? And, and that is uh, what you can do is look at, if you don't have direct evidence, you can, what we and others have done is look at disturbances in the immune system function that is characteristic of chronic infection. And all of these uh, items on this list have been seen in MECFS. And in fact, the reduced cytotoxicity of natural killer cells is something that was one of the earliest uh, abnormal immune uh, findings in MECFS. 
And if you want to, uh, I'm not going to go into this. If you want to learn more about that, please see my talk in the Immune System Roadmap webinar and uh, also Jessica, Jessica Maya's talk in the Metabolism Roadmap webinar, which talks more about these. So there are some corollaries of the enteroviral uh, hypothesis. Uh, one is that failure to clear the enteroviruses could result in continued attempts by the immune system to respond and therefore continued inflammation. And this, just like uh, what uh, Michael was showing for SARS-CoV-2, this could have a downstream effect uh, leading to a variety um, of phenomena in metabolism. The present uh, uh, enteroviruses uh, have, uh, different enteroviruses have different preferences for where they go in, in your body. There are neurotropic ones, there are ones that prefer muscles, but ones that are in the brain and nerves, these could be causing ongoing damage and disruption of the nervous system function. The taxing of the immune system to continuous immune st stimulation may result in the escape of previously controlled human herpes virus infections. And this could also perhaps cause susceptibility to new infections with herpes viruses. I also do think that chronic EV infection and uncontrolled herpes viruses or endogenous retroviruses, which we're going to be hearing about later, may collaborate in producing symptoms and then prevent recovery. And so they are very important in the illness. I'd like to end by just mentioning that we are pursuing uh, studies of these um, of, uh, of these uh, the molecular basis of MECFS under the auspices of a, a funding from NIH and NIH MECFS Center. We also have funding from the Amar and We and Me Foundation, private donors and Cimarron Research. And we have a collaboration with the Hospital for Special Surgery in Manhattan, New York, and uh, we are going to be getting muscle uh, biopsies from subjects there. And if you are interested, uh, please uh, send inquiries to Carl Franconi at cornell.edu. As far as research priorities, uh, this is my last slide. This, the, these are uh, what I think we need to know. We need to know what the incidence of chronic interviral infection is. Maybe it's low, maybe it's the majority of patients. We really don't know. We need molecular markers to distinguish pre-2020 MECFS cases from long COVID cases. Uh, that uh, have, um, as uh, Michael was referring to, COVID-related ME. We need to find out whether an acute interviral infection, even if it doesn't become chronic, may lead to MECOS, does it cause some damage? And that given that interviruses are not only associated with MECFS, but other, other terrible diseases like type 1 diabetes, cardiomyopathy, and acute flaccid myelitis, we need vaccines and drug treatments for both acute and chronic EV infections. We need to know whether or not herpes viruses and endogenous retroviruses are contributing to susceptibility to or maintenance of chronic EV infection. And I also think that we need guidance from medical professions, professionals about diagnosis of post-acute infection syndromes because it'd be a very bad shame that some people who think they have incurable MECFS actually have treatable infections, especially people with certain bacterial infections. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. So there is a question um, in the Q&A um, that asks about swabbing skin surfaces to identify which viruses and bacteria live on the skin. And back of the throat, you talked about a study that compared that. Um, perhaps persistence of MECFS symptoms are caused by infectious pathogens, viral, bacterial, or fungal that live on, on this human skin um, that some people are genetically susceptible to. Um, the person says that a similar study was recently done, they think, on fibromyalgia, in which they found a possible bacterial cause. What are your thoughts about, about that? I have seen a few studies in which people um, uh, did think it could be a pathogen on, on your skin that, that could be involved, be involved. And certainly pathogens can be anywhere <laughs> that might be involved in MECFS. The throat swab is particularly, I think, uh, important because respiratory viruses can often be found in throat swabs. That's 
as we well know when we were being swabbed for SARS-CoV-2. So um, I think sw throat swabs are particularly important for uh, analysis um, uh, for respiratory pathogens, but I don't think we can eliminate any location in the body as potentially involved in uh, having a pathogen that could be in affecting any CFS. Yeah, there's a comment here from Tobias that um, one study from their group in Stockholm found reactivation of latent herpes viruses, EBV, HHV6, and endogenous retroviruses, HERV-K, in the oral mucosa, but not in plasma, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Studying was, study was done on um, 95 individuals with ME-CFS and healthy, 110 healthy controls and provides the reference here. So yeah, sure. uh, thanks for that reference. Maybe uh, we'll be hearing about that from Tony Komaroff as well. <laughs> yeah. So someone says um, that OPKO and Merck are working on a vaccine for EBV. Um, is it even realistic for people sick so long, say 10 years, middle and middle aged, to think they may be candidates for the vaccine? I, I guess the question is whether that vaccine will uh, be able to help people who are already infected or whether right. just infection. So we, we don't really know. There have been some uh, some people with long COVID who claim that the vaccine actually made them better. The vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we, we, you know, it's, it's, we can't really predict. Yeah. Right. So those are all the Questions that are in the chat for you. What, what, maybe there's another one here. Oh, well, so the question is really to us at NIH how is NIH working with medical school research departments to get out presentations such as Dr. Hansen's? Um, yeah, we're making the, the videos are available online and we'll make, make them available. Um, once we have the full research report, that will also be made available. Yes, and of course, uh, we also have a collection of videos done by not only myself, but other people in our group on our mm -hmm. uh, website that I showed. So if you want to uh, go to neuroimmune.cornell.edu, and you'll see a whole collection of uh, talks given by people associated with our center. So question, are there any treatments for EV infections? Well, that's that's actually a big problem. There really aren't good drugs. There are some studies, uh, people trying to develop good drugs. Um, uh, various, uh, uh, some people have had success treating individuals with interferons. There's a preparation of Chinese herbs that's been used, but, and of course, remdesivir and the other, um, the other, uh, RNA virus affecting drugs, but we don't have a good drug for an enteroviral infection, uh, for an, an acute enteroviral infection, and we really need them. Uh, mm -hmm. And so right now, if you were to find out that you have an acute enteroviral infection, there's not much we can do. But if we do find that, you know, suppose half the people who have MECFS have an, an enteroviral infection, I would certainly hope that that would stimulate much more interest in developing drugs that can overcome such an infection. The other thing I, I may not have brought out is that I'm not saying that a single enterovirus is causing these infections. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read the old literature um, uh, and, and the descriptions of the disease, the outbreak, the outbreaks don't sound identical. They, 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 there are some different features of the patient symptoms. I mean, they all had this post-exertional malaise, they all had terrible fatigue, muscle pain, but there's some differences that make you think that it uh, may not be the same enterovirus. And um, the fact is that enteroviruses are actually far more variable than coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. They do not have a proofreading uh, uh, ability like coronaviruses are. So there's far more, uh, different types of enteroviruses than coronaviruses. And look how many new coronaviruses we have had developed in the last three years. So, so I do suspect that there, there are going to, if when, when we look at what might be present in people with ME-CFS, it's not going to be the same virus. 
So the last question for you that came in via email, um, does the research you described encompass bacterial infections as well as viruses that have triggered a dysregulated immune response leading to ME-CFS? And do you know who or where this research is currently being done, if there's any research? Yeah, so as I mentioned, what do you call, uh, for example, post-Lyme or post-chlamydia uh, uh, pneumonia? What do you call that ME-CFS uh, is up for debate. Um, I actually think it should be called post Lyme. I think it should be called post chlamydia or post Ross River virus. Mm -hmm. I don't, th uh, and I do think all of these syndromes should be studied. Uh, uh, all the victims of these terrible uh, post acute infection disease syndromes should uh, have uh, have some recourse, some treatments. But um, but I think by we just can't lump them all together and expect that a treatment for um, a bacterial infection is, is going to work on someone who has ME-CFS because, uh, because of a viral infection. But, but this, is, this is actually something that I'm hoping that long COVID will bring out, that yeah. we should not be neglecting post-infectious disease syndromes, that there are many of them and they shouldn't be dismissed and swept under the rug. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. So we're at time and it's time for us to take a break. So um, we'll return at 1.15 for the next speaker. So thank you very much, Maureen. That was really excellent. And I'd like to welcome everyone back from the break um, and turn it over to you, Maureen, to introduce the next speaker. Maureen, back with us? Yep, there you are. Okay, it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Komarov uh, for the next talk. Uh, he is Distinguished Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he is well known to most ME-CFS researchers and patients due to his long career in the field, as he was one of the first clinicians to realize that he was seeing patients with a new syndrome in the early 80s. And he recognized the importance of and studied the incline village outbreak that occurred in the mid 80s. He's published over 270 research articles. He was editor-in-chief of the Harvard Medical School Health Publications and wrote a, wrote a syndicated newspaper column for the layperson that was called Ask Dr. K. And at the recent IACFSME meeting, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award. And he's well known for his excellent uh, reviews uh, of MECFS, and I'm eager to hear what he has to say about uh, herpes viruses. Thanks so much, Maureen. Thanks for inviting me to participate today and uh, to talk on this subject. Uh, the, um, the herpes viruses, there they are. Whoops. Um, I wanted to start, preface the comments by saying I've designed this talk for a general audience, not including, I know, people who are neither health professionals nor biologists. So I'll be showing a minimum amount of actual data, but rather summarizing what rep many replicated studies have concluded from the data. Um, I'm gonna make some general comments about different types of viruses uh, and different responses of the body to different types of viruses. I'm going to address the questions we've all been asked to address. Uh, what do we know? What don't we know? What do we need to know? And among the things that we need to know, how would we prioritize the importance of getting answers? Um, let me begin by saying, I think it's un extremely unlikely that MECFS is caused by a single novel infectious agent. Uh, always have thought that, uh, and if anything, the last 40 years have only reinforced that judgment. Instead, I think there's increasing evidence that MECFS involves a dysfunctional immune and metabolic response to infection with any of several infectious agents, as uh, Dr. Hansen 
has described. Uh, and also, it may, that same dysfunctional response also may occur following physical trauma, major physical trauma. I'm not going to discuss that today, but there's evidence for that. Uh, no virus, including the herpes viruses, have been proven to trigger or perpetuate MECFS, particularly to perpetuate it. Um, and the herpes viruses that I think have been most closely linked at, to MECFS, EBV and human herpes virus 6A and B, they, those uh, clearly can trigger the illness, but whether they perpetuate the illness uh, remains uncertain. And if it's true, it's only true in some people with MECFS. So a few comments about the different kinds of viruses that infect us. Some of them multiply, but then are fully eradicated by the immune response. Others multiply, but remain latent in some of our cells. Of those that multiply, but then are fully eradicated, as Dr. Peluso has showed so nicely for SARS-CoV-2, even if the virus itself, living replicating virus, has been eliminated, some of its nucleic acids and antigens can persist in the body in harbors where they, they defy eradication. And in those harbors, they can be triggering an ongoing chronic immune response. Among the viruses that multiply but then become latent, uh, those viruses can periodically reactivate and multiply and thereby trigger an immune response. I also want to uh, introduce a concept that may be a tangent in this context, but may prove relevant to MECFS, to a handful of cases. Uh, most of us, uh, recognize viruses as something we catch from other people. They're transmitted to us at some point in our lives from other people. But some viruses are inherited. Viruses have genes that are made either of DNA or RNA. These genes control how the virus works, how it infects our cells, reproduces. And it turns out that thousands of years ago, some viruses inserted their genes into the DNA of a human egg or sperm cell. When that happened, the, the person who was born from that egg or sperm cell had the viral DNA present in every cell of their body and they were able to pass that viral DNA on to their offspring. We'll come back to that in a little more detail shortly. There are two examples of this. One are the endogenous retroviruses that you'll be hearing about next, and the other is human herpes virus 6. The human herpes virus family consists of nine viruses. There are eight numbers because these viruses, human herpes virus 6A and B, are really two distinct viruses. I think the evidence linking any of them with MECFS is strongest for Epstein Barr virus, EBV, and HHV 6A and B, and that's what I'll be discussing. So first, some general comments about all three of these viruses. They infect nearly everyone. Nearly 90% of all humans are infected with these viruses. And because, as I said, they are viruses that remain latent in the body, once infected, one is permanently infected. And starting from a young age. 
Another feature of all of these viruses is that they're neurotropic. They infect several types of brain cells and they're immunotropic. They infect several types of immune cells. As I said, infection with these viruses is ineradicable and permanent. The immune system can recognize them, can try to eliminate them, but never succeeds. They remain. The initial primary infection with EBV causes mononucleosis. Indeed, it's the, by far the most common, if not the exclusive cause of mononucleosis. HHV-6, particularly HHV-6B, is the cause of a, a childhood disease, roseola. Uh, but with both of these viruses, with all three of these viruses, that primary infection often is silent, uh, doesn't produce any symptoms or disease. Reactivated infection with any of these three viruses has been linked to several diseases, not a link that's absolutely proven, but pretty strong. Uh, and, uh, but despite that, most of us carry around these viruses, which periodically reactivate without causing us any problems. So let's turn to a few comments about EBV and what we know about its relationship to MECFS. After mononucleosis, which is commonly caused by EBV, uh, with mononucleosis and for the weeks after, there's uh, often severe fatigue. It's a debilitating part of the illness. While uh, the textbooks say, and it's probably true, that the most, most cases, the illness, including the fatigue, are gone by eight weeks. It is now clear that it can last much longer in some people. Um, and only since longer term follow-up studies of people with mono have been done has that become clear. Chronic fatigue syndrome, according to one study that Dr. Hansen uh, uh, mentioned, can occur in up to nine to 10% of patients after mono, uh, but rarely occurs, if at all, after other kinds of upper respiratory infections. People who develop uh, MECFS and fatigue syndromes in general after mono are not more likely to have had a past psychiatric disorder. I say that because when this was all first being discussed and studied in the 1980s and 90s. There, there were many people who said, the only thing that distinguishes a person who gets mono and then goes on to MECFS from one who gets mono and returns to normal health is that the one who goes on to MECFS had some pre-existing psychiatric problem that led them to have MECFS. I think we can now say categorically that from scientific evidence, that's not the case. Post-mononucleosis MECFS appears most likely to occur in people with severe fatigue, disruption or dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, or low-grade inflammation during the acute mono. And you notice some parallels there with what Dr. Peluso was describing for acute SARS-CoV-2 and long COVID. By six months post-mono, those who develop MECFS have elevated pro-inflammatory cytokine levels still six months after acute mono, reduced anti-inflammatory cytokine levels, which only makes the effect of the pro-inflammatory cytokine levels more potent. Uh, and they have lower ACTH levels. Uh, when compared with those people who get mono but do not go on to ME-CFS. There is one interesting uh, protein, one mechanism perhaps, 
So the EBV uh, protein DUTPase, as Dr. Klimas and her group and others have, have studied, induces neuroinflammation and lethargy in animal models. And some people with MECFS have elevated antibodies against EBV uh, DUTPase. So it remains a plausible hypothesis that one mechanism by which EBV may produce fatigue and lingering fatigue syndromes is through this particular EBV-related protein. So new primary infection with EBV can trigger MECFS for sure. I think that's been well established. Can reactivation of EBV then be explaining the recurrent cycles of, ME, of symptoms in MECFS in the months and years thereafter? Uh, serum antibody levels in people with MECFS often, but not always, indicate that the virus is reactivating, by which I mean there are elevated levels of antibody to the early antigens of the virus that are associated with reactivation with the lytic phase of the virus. And IgM antibodies, or very high IgG antibodies, to the virus's capsid antigen are seen more often in MECFS than in healthy control subjects. What about HHV6 A and B? As I said, this produces a lifelong infection in most of us and persists in our brain and in some of our immune system cells for the rest of our lives. One of the remarkable things about these two viruses is their tropism. Most viruses target one or two types of cells in the body, and that's it. They look for those cells. They try to infect those cells. Those are the only cells they're capable of infecting. HHV6 A and B, however, are able to infect a remarkably broad number of very different types of cells in our body many types of immune system cells, T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, monocytes, macrophages, myeloid cells, virtually all of them. And they're also able to infect many different brain, central nervous system cells, not just the neurons, but more prominently, the immune system cells of the brain, the microglia, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes. They also are able to infect other than immune system or brain cells, fibroblasts, salivary gland cells, other cells elsewhere in the body. So any virus that can infect a lot of different cells, tissues, and organs um, raises questions about whether it can cause disease of those organs. What disease associations are there now solidly for HHV6 uh, a and B. Well, as I said, the childhood disease roseola or exanthem subitum, two different names for the same disease, uh, are clearly caused by uh, these viruses, particularly B. Febrile seizures. Uh, seizures in children when they have fevers are very common, um, and these are clearly caused by HHV6 A and B. In fact, they're those viruses are the most common causes of febrile seizures in young kids. Encephalitis and pneumonia in people who are immunocompromised are caused by these viruses. And there, I would argue, uh, in my opinion, pretty strong evidence. There is pretty strong evidence that the viruses are linked to temporal lobe epilepsy and to multiple sclerosis, as is EBV. And indeed, there's evidence uh, that, that both viruses together, EBV and the human herpes virus 6 viruses, might have synergy in producing uh, these illnesses. 
there's a very, for anyone interested in the details behind that broad assertion, there's a review article at the bottom of this slide that goes into it in agonizing detail. What do we know about the relationship of HHV6, A and B, to MECFS? Um, as I said earlier, because it's such a common virus, because so many of us have it, all of us have some level of antibodies against it. So finding that someone with MECFS has antibodies to these two viruses doesn't tell you anything. However, if you do antibody and other kinds of studies to try to identify people, not just who have infection, since all of us do practically, but people who have activated or reactivated infection, the studies do find a strong association with MECFS. And that includes studies using a PCR of the, either the serum or plasma to look for viral DNA, studies of IgM antibodies to the early antigens of the virus, which are indicative of reactivated infection, and even includes some studies of primary cell culture from the lymphocytes of people with MECFS, in which a characteristic cytopathic effect has been demonstrated and confirmed by monoclonal antisera specific for HHV6 and confirmed by in situ nucleic acid hybridization studies in those lymphocytes and confirmed by electron microscopy showing the virus budding from the surface of those lymphocytes. And all of the studies that I summarized with a full bullet or some the more important ones were summarized in that slide. Might an unusual feature of human herpes viruses, uh, 6A and B, affect a person's vulnerability to getting MECFS? Uh, as I said uh, earlier, there is a very interesting thing that happens with these viruses, and that is that some people inherit them. How does that happen? Well, the viruses, these two viruses have a very unusual way, unusual for herpes viruses, certainly, of achieving latency inside a cell. That unusual way of achieving latency, which I'm about to describe, has caused a remarkable phenomenon um, that I will also describe that could theoretically uh, influence a person's vulnerability to developing MECFS, and in fact, that could have even broader implications for human health. Most human herpes viruses, like Epstein-Barr virus, for instance, the, the viral DNA enters a person's cell, enters the nucleus of the cell, and then it curls up into a little ball, a circular, a circular, uh, a circle of DNA. As a circle, it can't reproduce itself, but it can remain sitting there, latent, quiet, ready if something happens to it to reproduce itself. With Epstein Barr virus, a typical infected cell has about 30 to 60 of these circular copies of the viral DNA inside the nucleus of the cell. Sometimes that circle pops open. It becomes no longer a circle, it becomes linear. And when it's linear, then it can reproduce itself and produce a lot of copy viruses. With human herpes virus 6, its means of achieving latency is different. As the virus enters the cell and then enters the nucleus, it attaches, it doesn't curl up into a circle, it attaches itself to 
the chromosome to the host cell, the human DNA in the nucleus. I'll come back to what, what, how that affects uh, the possibility of vulnerability to, to MECFS. So I'm making a distinction here between what happens to nearly all of us in our lifetimes, which is that the HHV6 virus has been transmitted to us from some other person, typically early in our lives, and that virus then infects a tiny fraction of our cells for the rest of our lives from this inherited condition. These somatic cells, uh, maybe cells of our immune system, cells of our brain, remain latent in us. But over the last 350,000 years or so of human history and hominin history, our pre predecessor species, uh, on multiple different occasions, HHV6, A or B, inserted its genome into the telomere of a human germ cell, an egg or a sperm cell. And as I described earlier, as a result, the person born from that germ cell had the viral DNA in every cell in their body and was able to pass the viral DNA on to their offspring, who were able to pass it on to their offspring, et cetera, throughout human history. As a result of that, about one to 2% of the human race inherits HHV6 DNA from a parent and has the viral DNA present in every cell in their body. And not only is the genome present in every cell of the body, but it has been shown that it is capable in many cell tissues, if not all, of reactivating, producing new virus, and eliciting an immune response. So what might be the health consequences of that inheritance? Uh, and in particular, could it increase or decrease even our vulnerability to getting MECFS? We just don't know. The number of studies so far are small, uh, but there are underway quite large studies that I hope will offer some clarity on that possibility in the next year or two. Okay, so herpes viruses and long COVID. We've talked up till now about herpes viruses and MECFS. What do we know about herpes viruses and long COVID? I'm only going to very briefly summarize this, and Dr. Peluso uh, and, and uh, Dr. Hansen described part of this already. Um, it is true that MECFS and long COVID share very many symptoms. There are some differences, and Dr. Hansen mentioned that the loss of smell and taste are the most obvious ones. Those almost certainly are symptoms that are unique to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, to its effect on the cells of the nose and the nervous system in the nose. Um, but what is becoming clearer with, with time is that the two conditions also share many underlying pathophysiology, share much underlying pathophysiology. This is outlined in a, a recent review article that's at the bottom of the slide. It is also possible that not only the symptom similarity and the similarity in pathophysiology that MECFS shares with long COVID are also shared by, uh, by other post-acute infection syndromes, as Dr. Hansen described. Um, that, I think, as I will say in conclusion, is um, a very important thing for us to be pursuing right now. Reactivation of EBV may also be associated with long COVID. I'll talk a little bit about that next. Reactivation of EBV during 
acute COVID, viremia during acute COVID, turns out to be a strong predictor of the development of long COVID and is also correlated with increased percentages of CD4 positive cells and cytotoxic CD8 positive cells, as well as exhausted CD8 positive cells. In other words, there is more of them and they're getting more and more tired doing battle against presumably SARS-CoV-2. There is elevated IgG against the lytic antigens of EBV, indicating that there is EBV reactivation, uh, and that the increased reactivation of this virus in people with long COVID is, character is, is different from what you see in people who got acute COVID, but now have recovered fully and don't have long COVID. And the, these findings are summarized in the two papers at the bottom of the slide. So what don't we know and what do we need to know about the relationship of these three viruses to MECFS? I would say that my, my overview of the evidence is that while there's strong evidence that the viruses are reactivated more often in people with MECFS, than in healthy control groups, what we don't know is, is reactivation of these viruses specific to MECFS, or is it also seen in other post-acute infection syndromes? We know it's seen in long COVID, which presumably is one post-acute infection syndrome. But I think it's worth uh, inquiring as to whether it's also seen in other illnesses that we think of as non-infectious that are characterized by chronic debilitating fatigue. And I'm thinking of multiple sclerosis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, major depression, uh, and, and quite a number of others. Do the reactivated viruses, which I think for which at least with MECFS and long COVID, there's good, good evidence. Do these reactivated viruses though, contribute to producing the symptoms or are they just an epiphenomenon? They're there, you can measure them. They are indicators that something's gone wrong with the immune system, that immunity is dysregulated, but they're not actually causing the symptoms. We need to get a better handle, a better answer to that question. And if we find out the answer is yes, they do seem to be contributing to causing the symptoms, then what are the mechanisms by which reactivation of these viruses causes these symptoms? Uh, for example, does the DUTPAs that I mentioned that all three of these viruses have uh, does it, when the viruses are in the brain, produce low-grade neuroinflammation that leads to the symptoms? That's a studyable hypothesis and a plausible one in my view. Is uh, reactivation of these viruses a feature of other fatiguing illnesses? I, I now put this as a high research priority. As I said a minute ago, it's one of the important unanswered questions. I'd put it near the top of my list. Do reactivated viruses contribute to producing the symptoms or are they just an epiphenomenon? That would be my number two priority. Um, and, and it's important because if they're contributing to producing the symptoms, then you have a target for treatment. You, if you could intersect the way these viruses, the reactivation of them generates the symptoms, you could uh, eliminate the symptoms. If the reactivation of the viruses does contribute to the symptoms, what are those mechanisms? And if there's a strong correlation found between reactivation of latent virus and flares of symptoms, then clinical trials could test whether antiviral therapy at times of symptom flares 
might offer symptom relief. Such a trial would require you to be monitoring people with ME-CFS regularly for evidence with tests that provide evidence of reactivation of the virus uh, during a time of a flare. And if you found diagnostic test evidence of reactivation, then treatment at the moment of reactivation might plausibly intersect the flare of symptoms worth pursuing. So in summary, um, MECFS is definitely not caused by a single novel infectious agent, certainly including uh, any of these three human herpes viruses. Instead, I think there's growing and quite persuasive evidence that MECFS involves a dysfunctional immune and metabolic response to infection with any of multiple infectious agents. But I would also echo what Dr. Hansen said, not with all infectious agents. There is something about the infectious agents that have been linked to MECFS that they share in common. And I would propose, as Dr. Hansen did, that two things that are, that are important are the fact that they're able to persist in the body or pieces of them at least are able to persist in the body is one thing they share. Another thing they share is that they can infect the brain and the immune system and or the immune system. However, new primary infection with EBV, and I think there's some not as good evidence with HHV6 A and B can trigger the onset of MECFS. And whether these two viruses, when they are reactivated, whether that reactivation produces a flare of symptoms in MECFS, still remains an open and very important question to pursue. So finally, uh, I think the role of these herpes viruses, particularly since most of them are infections we acquire early in life, but then remain with us and reactivate periodically. Whether this phenomenon that we've known for 50 years exists is not an issue. Whether the reactivation of these viruses produces diseases of any sort remains an increasingly plausible hypothesis, and one that I think is very important to pursue more broadly, both in MECFS and in long COVID. So I'll stop there and uh, wait for the questions. Thank you very much, Tony. That was really a wonderful review. Um, so there's a question, and I think you did address this, but I'll ask it. You mentioned incorporation of viral genome into human sex cells. In the distant past, can and does that event happen in recent times with newer viruses? Is there evidence of that? Um, there is some evidence that it, it continues to occur with human herpes viruses, 6A and B. Um, whether it's occurring with other viruses currently is more debatable. There have been people who argued that it can occur occasionally with viruses called bornaviruses, for example. The evidence for that is not, in my opinion, is not very strong, and if it happens, it's not very frequent. But, um, but it is, you know, it does occur in one to three percent of the human race, uh, and that's a lot of people, and it's a lot of potential disease associations that fortunately uh, are currently being actively pursued. Thank you. David, you have a question? Yeah, I was, I was curious. Um, when a person has uh, reactivated um, antibodies, um, is it always the case where there's an increased viral load or is it perhaps sometimes a misfiring of the immune system caused by a different infection or something? Uh, it's a good question, David, and, and I think it's not all, to the extent it's been studied, and I'm, I don't think for these viruses it's been studied very well, 
um, there, there isn't always a direct correlation between the viral load going up and the re evidence of reactivation, the immunologic response to the viral reactivation going up, but they tend to correlate. Um, but but uh, I think here, the point that Dr. Hansen made is really important. It's easy to study these viruses in the blood, which is why we do it in the blood. But if they're causing symptoms, they are doing it probably by what they're doing in the brain. And that's a much harder thing to study in a living human being than their blood is. So uh, I always take with a grain of salt, uh, any studies that draw inferences from blood studies of reactivation of these viruses to their link to a disease, because uh, the blood is the easiest compartment to sample, but it may not uh, represent what's happening deeper inside the body where it's harder to, to do studies. Thank you. Cody, do we under, I saw this question, do we understand what causes a virus to reactivate? Um, no, I mean, the, the, certainly experimentally in the lab, you can introduce into a cell culture with viruses in it certain chemicals that induce it to reactivate. Uh, but how those chemicals then change the switches in the viral genome to cause it to assume its replicative form uh, is much less well understood. Certainly not well understood by me, but it's, it's uh, also something that people have been pursuing for a long time. We, right. some, it's understood to some degree, but, but not in any depth. Great. Are there any other questions? I don't see, oh, let me check the Q&A one more time. Uh, there's just a comment here that um, Jared Younger uses sophisticated imaging that can look at inner brain inflammation and even very mild increased brain temperature. Um, yeah, so which is which is interesting as well. Are there any other questions from anyone on the panel? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Tony. And I'll turn it Pleasure. over to Maureen to introduce the next speaker. Okay, so uh, our next and last speaker is uh, Simon Carding. Uh, he is professor and research leader at Norwich Medical School and member of the Norwich Institute for Healthy Aging and Gastroenterology and Gut Biology. <clears throat> he was a Howard Hughes Fellow in the Immunobiology Group at Yale and on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania before joining the faculty at Leeds University. In 2008, he joined the University of East Anglia to help head the gut biology research program. His research concerns the mechanisms of intestinal microbial tolerance and the role that microbe host crosstalk plays in establishing and maintaining gut health. And he has worked on an ECFS uh, in, this, in this context, but today he's going to be reviewing a different topic. So Simon, go ahead. Thank you, Maureen, for the introduction. Um, so it will come as probably no surprise based on Maureen's introduction that my interest in ME is in the human microbiome, in particular the virome, and how that may be a reservoir or source of microbial antigens or mediators that can cause or perpetuate ME. But as Maureen says, today I'm going to talk about HERVs. So my talk um, I'm going to start off by describing what we know, um, and I'll give a little bit more background than probably other speakers have, because this was not only new to me, but I'm sure it's probably new to a lot of people in the audience. Uh, and these are the things that I'm going to cover eventually leading up to the small number of studies that have been carried out looking at HERVs in MECFS. And I think in the context of virology and viruses in ME, the study of HERVs might be what Mooring would consider a cottage industry at this point. But at the end, I'm going to put up a hypothesis, which I think will might leak in very nicely to the previous speaker, where we can maybe link HERVs to 
herpes viruses as a pathway in the development of ME-CFS. So uh, this slide just includes some basics. So ERVs are a type of retrotransposon, which is like jumping genes. So they can insert themselves, extricate themselves from various parts of the genome and insert themselves elsewhere. And the concept of transposable elements uh, was discovered by Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering them. ERVs are RNA viruses. So to integrate into our genome, they first have to convert their RNA into DNA, a complementary copy. And over human evolution, this infection integration has left us with about 8% of our human genome being encoded or attributable to ERVs. And this has principally come about because as the previous speaker mentioned, they can infect germ cells, sperm and eggs, allowing them to be vertically inherited or transmitted to sustain their presence in the human genome. And they can integrate randomly throughout the genome, so they can influence global transcription, many different types, some that are critical to mammalian development. And probably the best example of how important these are to us, and they're not, shouldn't be considered half unnecessary, is that they play a critical role in the development of the placenta. And some believe that the evolution of the placenta has been accelerated as a benefit to our evolution because of these retroviruses, which encode syncytins, which is encoded by a particular type of retrovirus called ERVW1. It's the envelope protein, and this plays an integral part, a critical role in placenta development. They can also influence other tissues, so the salivary gland, the liver, gut, bile duct, and also adipose tissue. And they can also influence immune cell function. Interestingly, they can change the major histocompatibility complex antigens, which are important in enabling our immune system to react to foreign antigens, pathogens, but discriminate self from non-self. So you can see that they could also be associated with autoimmune disease if they change the way our immune system reacts to our own cells. The vast majority of herbs are expressed in non-lymphoid tissue, they're in reproductive tissue, and I think that's important when we start to consider the studies that have been done so far on ERVs in ME-CFS research. Another important point is that ERVs sit at the crossroads between environmental factors that can cause changes in our epigenome or our genome that leads to change in turn to the regulation of our gene expression and in that regard, ERV activation. They can also be activated as a consequence of changes in our own genome, DNA sequence variations, that leads to transcriptional regulation activation of herbs. So they're at this crossroads of interaction between environmental and genetic influences, and their ability to influence phenotype then makes them, if you like, quite sensitive sensors to our environment, but also our genome and changes in that that can result in their activation, which could be beneficial to health or detrimental to health. So they are relatively small. Uh, their genomes comprise four functional genes shown here on this cartoon. Uh, and these genes are important for assembling virus particles. However, what's more interesting in terms of their influence on our, on our own genetic makeup and expression of our genes are long terminal repeat sequences that sit at the end of these functional genes, these are called LTRs. And in fact, 90% of the, in, um, these viruses are actually solo LTRs. So they do not contain any of the functional genes. They're just LTR sequences. And these, depending on where they're integrated into our genome, can switch on or switch off our genes. So they can influence a whole variety of uh, functionality in our genome. And over time, the functional genes can acquire mutations and deletions, which essentially can make them non-infectious. So the functional genes are much probably rare, if you like, in terms of trying to identify these uh, viruses in the body. What's more indicative of their presence and, and influence is looking at these LTR sequences. We can classify them um, according to structural and the genetic makeup, and there are three broad uh, classes, the gamma, beta, and spermatoviruses, and then down at the family level, 
uh, that they're usually designated or distinguished by a single letter. And that letter, it relates to the amino acids that are close to the site where a transcription would occur in the virus genome. So you can see we have F, H, I, E, R, et cetera, et cetera. And then some other unique number that sort of falls outside that category. So a relatively small number of classes, but in total, there could be more than 500,000 different types of retroviruses, endogenous retroviruses in our genome. Uh, they are associated with disease associations. Uh, and as I said, environmental lifestyle factors can impact on their regulation, their expression. Aging is one of those things that changes the profile of HERV expression. They're being implicated in various cancers and autoimmunity. So for example, the GAG and ENV genes of ERVs are biomarkers, are used as biomarkers in kidney, prostate, lung, breast cancer. How they work is not particularly clear at this point, but there are two probably mechanisms, an indirect one by inserting themselves into genome and disrupting genes that may regulate normal functions. And the other is to actually produce virus particles or virus antigens or transcripts, if you like, RNA, that then in of themselves can be harmful to cells. And it's interesting that the immune system is very reactive to HERV antigens. And in a large proportion of patients with myeloid malignancy, uh, the T cells, 50% of the T cells are, have reactivity or specificity, if you like, to endogenous retroviruses. So they are potent inducers of immune responses and they can be used as an indicator of malignancy or the stage of malignancy. Um, in the, regarding the brain, they're also associated with neurodegenerative diseases, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, for example. The herve K protein is neurotoxic, it destroys neurons if they're expressed in neuronal cells and tissues. And we could detect the presence of virus particles and virus proteins in multiple sclerosis patients. And these proteins are potent inducers of inflammation. They can elicit the production of cytokines, which are pro-inflammatory, interferon gamma, interleukin-6, production by peripheral blood cells from MS patients. And treatment with interferon beta as a therapy can reduce the viral load in the blood of MS patients. So in fact, HERV W and HERV WE1, which is syncytium 1, their presence in the blood can be used as a risk factor and a biomarker for multiple sclerosis. And what's been proposed as a plausible mechanism or pathway to developing MS is that we, the reactivation of enteroviruses results in the production of viral antigens, which are very good at stimulating lots of different types of immune cells, and that this overstimulation or chronic stimulation of the immune system by these HERV encoded antigens can then lead to the promotion of autoimmune disease, and in this case, multiple sclerosis, but perhaps other autoimmune disease. And I'm going to return to this at the end of my talk, as this may also apply to MECFS. So how is HERV expression normally regulated? So as I've said, it's highly active in embryonic cells and in stem cells. And in most differentiated cell types, they remain silenced. And to be expressed, they rely on our host cell transcriptional machinery. So they don't have the enzymes, the process to allow them to be transcribed into RNA and then into protein. So they rely on the host cell machinery to achieve that. Expression of HERV RNAs have seen in lots of inflammatory conditions, in particular SARS-CoV-2 that we've heard quite a lot about already, autoimmune diseases like MS and others, and also in cancer. So the way that the HERV virus genes are repressed or held under control is through DNA methylation, which is classified under epigenetics, and also histone modification. If the viruses escape this DNA methylation mediated control and actually make transcripts or RNA, then cells have the ability to degrade that RNA before it's released or before it has the ability to produce protein and virus particles. So those two steps, if you like, to prevent uh, expression or release of virus particles, one at the level of transcription, 
pre-transcription and one at post-transcription. And I'll just briefly talk about DNA methylation as this is one of the means by which this is studied in ME patients. So DNA methylation relates to the chemical modification of cytosine uh, residues that are part of DNA molecules. Depending on whether they're hypo or hypermethylation determines the ability of machinery to access the genes to switch them on or switch them off. So hypomethylation, for example, so that's less than normal levels of methylation of genes is related to cancer development because it increases instability of the chromosomes, allowing easy activation and more difficult to control activation, transcription of these genes. But on the other hand, hypermethylation can lead to the inactivation of our own tumor suppressor genes, which allows them mutations to accumulate in cells that can also lead to cancer development. So the balance in hypo and hypermethylation is not just important in cancer, but also for regulating expression of viruses in other conditions and situations as well. So methylation profiles, and particularly those that are associated with the LTR sequences of the viruses, are an important way in which to gauge whether or not they may be expressed in various cells and tissues. And methylation profiles can be uh, identified by various methodologies, and I've, I've identified some of them here. So bisulfite sequencing, which covers the whole genome generally. And then there are other more restricting methods that look at certain regions of the genome of specific genes. A more direct method is just to sequence everything with shotgun genomic sequencing, uh, using PCR as well to do genome-wide sequencing. This all relies on bioinformatic tools to interpret the sequence data. And there are a variety of software programs that have been evolved or have been generated to uh, be able to look at this in particular, the methylation profiles. But these are still in their relative infancy, so there are issues about their performance and variability. There are also microarrays, PCR, and then looking for proteins. Uh, we can use Western blotting, ELISAs, et cetera, from serum or tissues to visualize the presence of the proteins and maybe even the virus particles themselves. So indirect and direct mechanisms for looking at measuring herb expression. So this summarizes the studies that have been done so far in looking at global methylation patterns in MECFS. Um, as you can see, there are eight studies there, I think, that have been published to date. All of them, have, bar one, I think, have relied, no, all of them, sorry, have relied on the analysis of peripheral blood mononuclear cells, bulk preparations, or T cell fractions of these. The diagnostic criteria, there's good consistent there in FACUDA or the Canadian consensus criteria. Cohort size for all of these studies are quite small, particularly in terms of looking at uh, ME patients and considering the heterogeneity, they, they are small cohorts. The application, the methodology is also somewhat variable. And also this then translates into the number of methylated genes that can be identified. You can see there's a variation there in that column under analyze CPGs. Then looking at the differentially methylated sites, so they could be hypo or hypermethylation, you can again see the different studies have identified anything from less to 100 to more than 17,000. So a huge range across um, the different studies. And then in terms of looking at the ratio of hypo to hypermethylation sites, again, the studies, there's no consistent finding some studies identify a higher abundance of hypo methylation sites. Other studies, it's the converse, they, rec they identify a higher abundance of hypermethylation. So there's, there's a lot of contradiction and conflict, if you like, in the findings. Interestingly, when the impact of these methylations have been looked at on um, gene ontology studies, so trying to identify the cells and the systems that would be affected by these changes in methylation, one of the common features that comes out from this analysis is immune dysregulation. So a lot of these methylation changes are predicted to impact on immune cells and on immune cell function. So that I think is sort of a consensus finding. But again, picking through the details of this, there are 
discrepancies in the way the study has been carried out, the analysis. Um, so it, it's that is, a, I think, an interesting finding, but it needs to be substantiated. This study I put up here as well, because this takes uh, methylation studies a step further and trying to combine them with a different approach to identify gene-specific changes in ME-CFS patients. This, this is called recursive ensemble feature selection, or REFs, and it was initially based on looking at messenger RNA signals that were distinct in ME-CFS patients. And these were from databases, so they identified 23 genes which distinguished ME patients from controls with over 90% accuracy. But then they validated this against four methylation studies, which include those I mentioned on the previous slide. And from that, they identified 48 CPG methylation sites that were associated with marker genes that might predict disease status. And 10 of 23 of the encoded proteins these genes will produce are associated with immune function and infection. Again, sort of emphasizing that this herbs can impact on immune function and dysfunction, which is a, one of the key features, I think, of ME-CFS. The cartoon on the right-hand side identifies some of the key immune functions that are affected by this. So I've talked about uh, the major histocompatibility complex, cytokine receptors. There are also other ones which identify uh, marker genes such with viral infection, oxidative stress, and cellular metabolism. So I think the message from this study is that by combining different data sets, we can increase the resolution and discriminatory power of an individual data set to have a little bit more certainty, leading hopefully to evidence-based biomarkers, which we're all hoping will come for MECFS. So that I think is, is something that's very important, is combining data sets, integrating data sets. Looking at specific gene methylation patterns, so there are three studies here that I'm showing where they've just focused on specific genes. Perforin gene, which is important for uh, enabling T cells to be cytotoxic to kill virus infected cells, for example. Glucocorticoid receptor and the serotonin receptor, for which these have been linked to MECFS in other studies. So for perforin, there were no difference is in terms of methylation status. The glucocorticoid receptor, they identified a hypermethylation sequence uh, that was a signature for MA, uh, MS patients. And the serotonin study also identified altered methylation, which they predicted would change the way these receptors um, function. Again, linking to serotonin abnormalities in some MECFS patients. So those are just gene-specific methylation patterns. So I want to now sort of also talk about how herbs can be activated uh, through virus infections. So the list here shows RNA viruses as well as DNA viruses, which are capable of eliciting or inducing uh, herb expression. So HIV, for example, influenza virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and then of course the herpes viruses, cytomegaloviruses, these have all been linked to the induction or expression of specific types of human endogenous retroviruses. So there is definitely a link there between virus infection activation of uh, endogenous retroviruses. And then in terms of how these uh, expressed endogenous retroviruses impact on the immune system, I've already uh, sort of hinted at this in previous slides, but there are potentially four mechanisms. So the promoters and enhance, so the LTR, sequences of endogenous retroviruses, as I said, can act as promoters or enhancers for antiviral genes. So they can switch them off to leave cell the host more susceptible to virus infections. The viruses themselves can encode RNA, DNA, proteins, which are very potent stimulators of the immune system. These are called microbe associated molecular patterns, MAMPs, for example that are bound by pattern recognition receptors on a variety of immune cells. So they can stimulate lots of different immune cells. And then non-complementary RNA and double-stranded RNA that's produced from herbs can also be another stimulus for the immune system. And then of course the particles themselves and the proteins that make up the particles also have the ability to elicit uh, immune responses. 
So they're potent inducers of immune responses. Not surprisingly, they've been have, have been targeted as therapies. So neutralizing antibodies to HERV K, for example, have been used uh, to reduce size of tumors. They've been used in multiple sclerosis, type one diabetes. There is an anti herv W envelope specific antibody called Tamelilab, which is currently in phase two trials, both long COVID and multiple sclerosis. So that would be something of interest to the ME community, I'm sure. Um, they, they can also be um, targeted by vaccines as well. And also it's possible to engineer T cells so that they are specific, they can specifically react with particular HERV viruses. So HERV K, for example, if you can engineer a patient's T cells so that a large number of them have the capability of interacting with HERV K virus, then these are proven to be effective in patients with melanoma and breast cancer in animal models as well. And again, antibodies are T cells that target HERV K in PB peripheral blood mononuclear cells can inhibit cancer cell growth. So again, that links inappropriate expression or expression of particular types of enteroviruses to tumorigenesis and cancer development. And of course, epigenetic modifying drugs as well to, to change back the suppressive nature of the epigenome to suppress activation of endogenous retroviruses, another target to knock down or control or suppress endogenous retroviruses and the various enzymes inhibitors that are being used, um, starting to be used in preclinical studies at least. So in terms of HERV expression in ME, uh, it, as I said at the beginning of my talk, it's a small number of studies. Uh, they're listed here, um, two, five studies that I've identified. Uh, all but one rely on the use of peripheral blood mononuclear cells, case definition consistency, small numbers of patients again, and small numbers of controls, some variation in the assays that are used, antibody detection in serum, RT-PCR immunohistochemistry. And again, these are looking at specific, not global HERV expression, it's specific types of viruses, specific families. And the findings I've listed there, again, there's some variability in there from no difference when comparing ME patients to controls, to subsets of ME patients uh, having higher levels or, or more prevalent expression profiles of viruses. So again, there's, there's a lot of uh, variability and inconsistency in the results. But there again, this is only five studies in relatively small patient cohorts. So that's probably not too surprising. On this slide, I'm just showing some exemplar data. The first one is from the only study that's been carried out so far on tissue from ME patients. And interestingly, this is on gastrointestinal tissue. And this is interesting in light of what we've been hearing from the earlier talks about the tissue burden and viruses hiding in tissue rather than in the blood. And so this was a study dating to 2013, where they used antibodies to various HERV envelope proteins or GAG proteins. So the top panel shows four different antibodies that are reactive to some extent in the majority of the samples they obtained from biopsies, eight of 12 patients, compared to healthy controls where there's a lack of reactivity. Using multiple different antibodies to try and identify the cells that are expressing the virus or the, which the virus proteins were present in, that's shown in the bottom panel. And they could co-localize expression of some of these viral proteins to CD303 cells, which are identify an important immune cell population called dendritic cells, which are really the, 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 the conductors of the immune orchestra. They can initiate immune responses and they can regulate immune responses. So if a virus really wanted to have a maximum impact on the immune system, they would target dendritic cells. And then the text at the bottom just shows that they substantiated or validated this data using more conventional sequence analysis. And again, identified multiple contigs of known herb genes in the same tissue and samples cells that they extracted from the tissue. However, they were un unable to identify the open reading from the proteins that encode the um, all the virus proteins to make virus particles. So what they're looking at here immunohistochemically may be viral proteins and not virus particles. The study on the right is an RT-PCR based study in a small cohort of severe or moderate 
ME patients and controls. All samples to varying degrees expressed uh, or had detectable expression of HERF K and W as shown by the numbers at the top. But in looking at the levels of expression, they were able to distinguish moderately in moder moderate MECFS patients from healthy control and severely affected MECFS patients. The moderate patient had higher levels of expression of both HERF K and HW. So although the profile of expression of the virus is the same, it, some ME patients may have higher levels of um, certain types of HERV, uh, HERV viruses. And this was a very recent study. It's actually in a preprint form from the group in Valencia, uh, where they've been looking at trying to see if there were HERV signatures which would segregate MECFS patients from those with fibromyalgia. And again, this is a relatively small study, small numbers of um, patients in the different groups. But what they were able to do from looking at peripheral blood cells and looking at specific HERV expression profiles is they could identify two clusters of ME patients. One cluster, which had 21 unique HERV families where they were upregulated. Cluster two had 12 unique HERV families, which were silenced. And it was this group that correlated the closest to symptomology, disease severity, or, um, in terms of comparing it to FSF 36 uh, scores. So when they then took these um, particular viruses and mapped them to another immune-based database to try and identify which immune cells might be affected by these particular viruses, they were able to demonstrate an association of the silencing of these families with lower levels of particular types of T cells, gamma delta T cells, memory T cells, and plasma B cells. So again, this links again the viruses to causing or related to change in immune profile, immune cell populations in MECFS patients. Constraints of the study are like many of the other studies so far done on HERVs. There's small cohorts of patients. We're extrapolating two unrelated databases here, so there could be issues around that regarding the rigor of which that's done and the rigor in which the databases are assembled. Unfortunately, this study did not look at the immune cells in the patients from which they were doing the HERV analysis, so that would have been a nice uh, validation on top of using the Cybersort X database. And interestingly, the association did identify the immune cells didn't map to any of the known innate immune cell signatures, which, have, which are quite common in ME patients, and particularly natural killer cell defects. So I think what this uh, reinforces, and it's been mentioned in several other talks, is we need better patient stratification for both research and CTIMS to be able to tease apart which patients, in, in which patients HERV activation and which HERVs in particular may be playing a more prominent role in the disease process. So I've listed on this slide some of the issues with HERV analysis. I won't go through more because you can read them. But I think number two is important because, as I said, the highest levels of HERV expression are not in the cell immune cells. So looking in PBMCs may not be the right place to look for evidence of HERV activation and expression. We should perhaps looking at non-lymphoid tissues. So there's a bias there, I think. Um, there's also bias in methodologies. There are different methodologies used for this. All of them come with their caveats, their issues with sensitivity, reliability, et cetera. Um, and of course, looking for functionality, the question is what's more important? Is it the virus transcripts? Is it the proteins that they encode? Or is it the particles? Which is more important? Which is having the biggest impact in terms of impacting on the immune system and uh, ME disease in, pro in of itself? Uh, we've still got a lot to learn about uh, understanding the silencing and activation of HERV expression. Um, and the contributions to immunity, again, are only just starting to emerge. We're only just starting to get clues. But I think they're very intriguing clues. And then, of course, the key question is, is this a cause of the disease or could it actually, is it just simply an effect of another uh, ongoing symptomology that's triggered the activation of these? So lots of issues to address with HERV analysis in general. And then for looking in ME, these are some of the obvious caveats, different types of methodologies I've already said, uh, differences among cohorts. So case definition, there is 
relatively good consistency, but still there are different case definitions being used. Degree of severity, male versus female, disease duration, and infection history, I think is very important here as well. And we need larger cohorts in order to achieve um, the relative statistical power to be able to discriminate um, what's ME specific and what, which, is, which is not. And then we also need to consider environmental factors as well as epigenetic factors, because HERVs are responsive to changes in an individual's environment, exposed to environmental insults, as well as the change that may occur in the genome of the patient. So we need to take a little bit more broader look perhaps at not just the patient's symptomology, but their environment, their lifestyle, their behavior. And so this is my summary and the questions that it raises. I think there's enough evidence to say that HERVs, be they LTRs, proteins and or particles are expressed in at least some ME patients and in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells. But we may be missing the real picture because we're not looking in the right cells in which HERVs would be more uh, readily expressed or more abundantly expressed. So we need to address this further by looking at defined clinical subtypes. We need to correlate it with key physiological abnormalities, particularly the immune abnormalities, correlate with disease severity. And it would be really important to have a careful and accurate disease infection history to really start to tease out the causality of this. And HERS have the intriguing possibility of really being one of the drivers that could of cause the immune dysfunction that's prevalent in ME-CFS patients. But again, there's a lack of uniformity and the consensus at the moment. We need more studies to be able to tease out the noise from the genuine signal. And I think this is where combining uh, different approaches, different data sets can help improve the resolution of that. So this is the hypothesis that I, I think is worthy of consideration debate. Is the reactivation of HERV superantigens, the antigens that the HERV virus encodes that stimulate lots of different type of immune cells, is that reactivation a consequence of an acute or chronic virus infection, particularly those associated with uh, ME? So could the reactivation of HERVs and the expression of these superantigens be the missing link in the role to explain viral infections in ME, CFS, disease etiology? And with that, um, I will just leave you this slide, which is in order to test this hypothesis, this is, I think, what we need to do. Larger scale virus epigenome immune combined association studies that employ all of those things listed on by the bullet points there. And in particular, the one I keep emphasizing is combinatorial data to improve the precision and accuracy, combining data sets. And in that way, we can get a better understanding of the virus, genetic, immune factors that may contribute to ME-CFS. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that excellent overview, Simon. Um, so I'll start with a question from um, that came in here. Let me find it again. So is there any evidence that exercise can activate HERVs? Well, if you consider that as a stress, and it certainly stresses your immune system, as well as obviously muscle cell tissues, mm -hmm. now the hormonal system, then potentially, yes. And I, I think maybe over-exercising where you're actually causing tissue injury might be a scenario that could lead to activation or repression of certain genes through HERVs. Mm -hmm. So Possibly, yes, but I'm not aware of anybody that's even considered that for her expression in ME. That's certainly a plausible hypothesis, I think. Yeah, thank you. So another question, if her expression is dependent on host cell transcriptional machinery, wouldn't that link expression likelihood to major tissue damage that induces large tissue repair responses? Yet, I think it was mentioned that physical damage has not been shown to have a strong Association, association or to be seen in MECFS. What are your thoughts about that? So I, I think the injury to cells and tissues could feasibly come from activation of herds, which leads to the production of these super antigens, be they long, be they transcripts, proteins, or virus particles. And that chronic overstimulation of the immune system will cause the inflammatory cascade, 
And if that's not effectively shut down, the, these antigens continue to get expressed. That I think then leans, can lead to systemic inflammation, all sorts of tissue, cellular injury, which would be difficult to resolve once it's, once it's established a foothold. So another question, what is the most important resource that individuals with ME-CFS can direct their sometimes doubtful doctors to, re to regarding the validity of investigating chronic infection involvement in ME-CFS? And maybe that's a question for, for all the speakers. Yeah, I think so. I've already sent a couple uh, references for Michael Peluso, um, and, but uh, I've re I recently wrote an uh, article in PLOS Pathogens that could also uh, be, be referenced, I think. Um, if, you, if you Google my name and PLOS Pathogens, you'll find that ar article. Great, thank you. So just a question I had from all of these discussions, um, what is the ideal tissue to be studying? If, if not blood, um, clearly muscle, I think, is an interesting candidate, but what are there other tissues that we should be thinking about um, studying I, in ME-CFS? In terms of ease of access, I would say any mucosal tissue. So... You, know, you can take samples from the upper lower gastrointestinal tract, the nose, respiratory, that could take a bowel sample, uh, vaginal swab, maybe even skin swabs. I think they're a good place to go. Uh, otherwise, you're talking about more invasive procedures, take biopsies from deeper mm -hmm. tissues. So I think mucosal tissues would be a good place to start. I agree, those are good places to start. Uh, the problem is we don't have a bank of cadaver tissue, which has really benefited the people working on long COVID. And um, it would be really valuable to have, um, you know, access to the central nervous system, to the brain that you really can't easily get from uh, a living subject. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Are there other questions from, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, there's a specific question for you, Maureen, about when your study at the Hospital for Special Surgery will be up and running. You, you can contact us now to get on the list of uh, people to be contacted and screened. Uh, so, um, again, it's carl.franconi at, at, at cornell.edu. Just send an email and you'll be put on the list to be contacted. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from anyone on the panel or any other in the Q&A? Not, I'll turn it over to you, Maureen, for any last words you might have. Okay, well, I, I guess mainly my last words were to thank people for uh, going to the effort of, of doing this exercise, because uh, especially um, uh, doctors Komarov and Carding had to review information uh, on work that they weren't themselves working on. And that's always more difficult than, uh, than talking about your own work. So I really appreciate it. Uh, I certainly learned a lot about EBV, HHV and uh, HHVs and, and also uh, uh, endogenous retroviruses. And um, I uh, certainly look forward to, to further research in, in these areas. Great, with that, we'll call this <clears throat> webinar um, to a close. And I certainly thank all of you for attending and especially thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, Thank you to all of the speakers who, as Maureen said, did a tremendous job. I'm sure it was a tremendous amount of work to review the literature. So, um, and very thoughtful um, information and thoughts about research priorities and future directions in research on MECFS in this particular area. So I thank you and um, hope that you will join us for the next webinar, which will take place on December 8th. 
Thank you, everyone.